With fire and grace, we sing your praise, for you alone are God. Who is the man that will climb this mountain to him who sits above all things? He is the one that will drink from the fountain, thirsty he never will be. For as vast is all of the heavens, the multitudes of souls he sees. Through molten glass he ever beholds them, there is no one beyond his reach. With fire and grace we sing your praise. With hope true we follow you we believe you're the prince of peace and you're all we need with fire and grace we sing your praise for you alone our God I lay my life down on the altar The present, the future, the past God, you laid all the foundations Give me a faith to last Consume all my heart in your presence Eternally burn in love In the Holy of Holies I will praise you We will worship you Hello, everybody. How are y'all doing? Uh, Dalton Travis Gray here, and we've got Pastor Dean Odell, uh, legend in my book, on the on the stream. Well, good to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Uh, it's an honor to have you. Um, I, I I always enjoy talking to you and and hearing your advice, and and uh, I'm I'm so glad to introduce you to the channel. And uh, looks like we got a few a few people from from your camp on too, and, and that's exciting for me because. I'm in your camp as well, so. <laughs> well, that's uh, great. Yeah, so guys, I just want to say, Dean. Dean is a. Uh, you know, y'all know Dean. A lot of you know of Dean. Uh, I met Dean at uh, at Greg Locke's uh, Great uh, Earth Debate. You know, uh, and uh, that that was a good time to meet him. But uh, Dean has been in the ministry for a long time, and, and being that Stones of Zion is, is building a church and, and uh, building a ministry, uh, it's, it's important to have elders around, and Dean has really helped uh, you know, coach me on some things as, as I'm moving forward in ministry, and that's just a quick intro, but uh, I definitely want to give Dean a chance to, to uh, share with y'all uh, you know, his, his ministry, his testimony, his experience in ministry, and uh, for y'all to meet him. Well, thanks, brother. Hey, in that song in the beginning, uh, that's uh, just so everybody knows. Yeah, that was uh, Dalton there. He he wrote a song, Fire and Grace, kind of uh, inspired, I guess, by our church. So that was pretty cool. Um, but uh, I haven't even heard, I didn't haven't heard the whole thing yet. So I've got to listen to the, the. Uh, I didn't even know you put it out yet. So that's pretty cool. But uh, Well, yeah, that's just the raw version. I'm going to get the band recording soon. But that's oh, just me in, in this here, you know, my home studio here, uh, okay. putting it together here. Well, most, I mean, if, if you're, some of your audience, they, they don't know who I am. Of course, I, I, you know, I've been in the ministry now going on 37 years. I came back to the Lord you know, when I was 19 and it's, that was in 1987. And I'll help anybody try to do the math. I'm 56 years old. Uh, so I, I've been preaching since I was 19 years old. 
and uh, God's just done a, a, a lot of great things and you know, been a lot of been a lot of battles as well through all that. But uh, I've uh, God started me uh, planting churches in 1995 and started doing that in, in Alabama and Georgia and then one in Washington D.C. and uh, then he started dealing with me about writing books and on down the line. But so I've I've written four books and. Uh, 2008, I was in Washington, D.C., back at the church that I helped plant there in 2008. I mean, back in 2003, rather, and I was there in 2008. And then uh, the Lord spoke to me and sent me back to Alabama here to the Opelika, Auburn area to where I grew up to start a church. And we did that in 2009. So that's been 15 years ago. Uh, that's actually the longest I've ever pastored one church for 15 years. Uh, but it's it's been awesome. The Lord told me about our church that we would be the five loaves and the two fish. This was back in 2010, and I didn't know what that meant then, but I do now because uh, he he told me that we were just a small little lunch, but then he would multiply it and feed thousands of people. And so we still have a small church in Opelika. We're we're right around between 80 and 100 when everybody's there, and. Uh, but we reach thousands and thousands of people every week. And we have for years until, you know, YouTube uh, terminated my channel in 2021. Uh, but we were at that point, 24,000 subscribers and growing and reaching that I would 80 to hundred thousand views a month. It was, it was something else, but God's done a, a lot of great stuff. But, uh, you know, going back to 87, what was interesting back then is one of the things that happened when I first came back to the Lord, my first convert, uh, in a few months after repenting and returning to the Lord was a high level Satanist. Uh, she was in training to be uh, the high priestess. And anyway, she came to me and said, you know, we've been watching you and we know you're a real Christian. And then she told me they had cursed me and tried to kill me, some other things and nothing was working. And she actually wanted out of Satanism, but was afraid for her life. And uh, just told her the same Jesus that had been protecting me from them would protect her if she was serious about following Jesus and making him mm -hmm. Lord of her life. And uh, she did that. And of course we had an adventure for about a year <laughs> where uh, the demons manifested in her later on and had to cast a, a legion of demons out of her. And then of course the satanic cult harassed me and I've been shot at and everything else. But uh, Long story short, she she gave her life to Jesus, and it affected a lot of people back in those days. That's that was before the internet too, you know, before social media and all this stuff. But uh, it, it God's just done some great things. I've seen God heal. I still believe God heals, and and seeing great miracles from the deaf hearing, the crippled walking, and cancer vanishing, and you know, God's just He's been the same as it says. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I believe that and preached that since uh, 1987. Slain before the foundation of the world. Amen, brother. What do you know? People were coming to him by faith before he ever got here in time. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And, uh, yes, sir. It's just in a nutshell. You know, of course, you know, since we're going to get on the debate topic in a minute and the great creation debate between me and Craig Locke, uh, I'll just say this in 2015, I, you know, I constantly prayed over the years. The Lord would show me the truth about, I wanted the truth about everything. I don't care what it is. And I always pray, Holy spirit. I know there's things I don't see things. I don't know. Please teach me and open my eyes to what I don't see and what I don't know. And, um, and, uh, like around, I guess it was probably, uh, sometime in mid 2015, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, I have something else to show you. And it's big. And I thought, well, goodness, what else could there be? I mean, I was already one of the most controversial pastors that, you know, in the country. And uh, sure enough, about two months later, the Lord revealed to me what we now call biblical cosmology or AK flat earth domed cosmology and uh, not not flat earth society cosmology, but true, no. biblical, true <laughs> biblical cosmology. And uh, so that was in 2015. I want to tell you, and I've I've never seen more atheists, agnostics, ancient alien believers, New Agers come to Jesus once they saw the evidence for the true flat domed uh, cosmology that the Bible teaches, ancient Hebrew cosmology that's from Genesis to Revelation. But once they see the evidence, like with long distance photography and 
things that, you know, we do the math eight inches per mile squared and you see there's no curve and you start finding out that the sun and the moon are much closer and their lights, just like God said they were, and you know, on down the line, but I've seen more atheists come to Jesus in the, since 2015 than I did in all the years before uh, in the ministry. And I used to preach on college campuses and debate atheists and agnostics and people. And, you know, yes, we'd see one or two here or there, but we have seen droves. I, I have testimonies galore. In fact, one chapter of my book on biblical creation, uh, I, I dedicate the entire chapter to atheists and agnostics that have come to Jesus through the truth of biblical cosmology, flat earth. So that's, uh, and, and I will say this, it's a revival that has taken place outside of your average uh mainstream church they don't even most of them don't even know about it uh that all these people have been getting saved outside of that whole arena um and uh but i i know it's highly ridiculed and highly persecuted and highly attacked but i would never go back like i said i've seen the truth in the word i've seen too many people come to jesus through that truth and uh it's been actually been a great revival I agree. You know, something about when people come to him through that, that I've noticed, um, is that they, they never are letting go. Because, I mean, once you realize that our entire fundamental reality has been, has been part of the, the Bible verse that says he will deceive the entire world. You know, the Bible's not lying about that when it says that. When you realize that we've been deceived on that level and you realize how true each word is in that book, you know, people who come to him through that truth, it's like it's like fighting words at that point because, you know, you, you realize um, how much of a lie that we've we've all been bought into and you never want to look back. Yeah, I tell you, when that that particular, you know, I, I was born again at 11 years old and had a powerful born again experience. I mean, I was enveloped by the, the glory cloud of Jesus and I encountered him, but of course I never learned, you know, what it meant to walk with him. I was in this little Baptist church. And, you know, they didn't know what to teach me about any of that stuff. They don't and, teach you about hearing God's voice for sure. No, and my, actually my dad got saved in the same time period that me and my brother did. And my dad was reading the Bible and he got to the book of Acts and he went to this Baptist preacher that he loved, that we got saved under and said, hey, what about this? This baptism of the Holy Spirit, this gift of tongues and all this. And that Baptist preacher said, we don't talk about that and slammed the door in his face. Hmm. Now, he was a baby Christian and that sent him down a path, a bad path for the next, I don't know, 10 years or so of his life. And uh, but when I came back to Jesus and the Lord I, you know, I couldn't go to church for the first year, so I was just reading the book and I got to the book of Acts and I said, well, Lord, if they needed this, then I need this. And I prayed and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. What was powerful is uh, that was in 87 when I went to visit my dad. He was living in Oklahoma in 88. I knew for some reason I was supposed to share that with him. And I, when I shared that with him and said, Dad, you know, this is this is what you were getting close to finding and he i prayed laid hands on him and prayed for him and immediately he was filled with the holy spirit began to mm. speak tears just running down his face and uh you know that um that was that was just powerful but uh so you know we've been i, I we we've been there i've been the baptist i've been in the lord made me go to a methodist church for two years i've been in the assemblies of god and uh church of god i mean i've seen a little bit of everything when it comes to Christianity. I've been in, among some of the charismatic leaders that are now f off base. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen a lot in the last 36 plus years. And, uh, but Jesus is still the same Jesus, no matter how much counterfeit or opposition comes to the word of God, it's all still true. Amen. Yeah, it's funny you say you, I, you've been through, you know, so many denominations. I, I was raised Catholic. You know, I was even doing some altar boy service. I went to Catholic school, you know, got my hand slapped with the ruler. Probably probably needed it, to be honest with you. Um, and then, you know, my mother uh, and, and father split up. And, and so she took us into non-denominational after we went to a Baptist for a few years. Then we went to non-denominational. Then we started visiting uh, more Pentecostal and Assemblies of God gatherings. And um, 
having a dad shaped hole in my heart, you know, that caused me to start crying out to God, you know, as a, as a young, you know, in between, you know, 10 and 14. Now I was born with, with the prophetic gifting. I always had the, you know, this, the ability to discern spirits from a child, you know, and, and so I think whenever I really called upon the Lord, he, uh, he empowered uh, the gifts and, and uh, he began speaking to me as a, as a preteen. And uh, I took it to the youth group and, and they kind of ridiculed me for some of the experiences I was having. The first miracle I ever saw was at a homeless gathering and me and my best friend saw 123 sleeping bags turn into 350 sleeping bags. And then uh, not long after that, you know, the, the Holy Spirit told him and me, and I was 14, he was 15, to take our bikes down and deliver our, our friend down the street who was a gothic kid who liked to do some drugs and all that. And we laid hands on him and, and he started shaking. And uh, my buddy Josh, who was a football jock, even slapped him with the Bible, hit him on the chest with the Bible because the demons started manifesting. And uh, he got delivered. He, he threw his Ouija board away and, and uh, you know, started praising Yahweh and, uh, and turned his life around. And that was at 14 years old for me. So, you know, when it comes to the Holy Spirit interaction, I just testify, you know, to each person listening, as Dean just did, that if we come to him with the full desiring earnest and true uh heart that that he is not not only willing but he is he is even just to give you what you ask because he didn't die for nothing and uh he lo he loves to bless his kids with those gifts but uh yeah i don't want to get to preaching right now but uh, yeah <laughs> all right it was inspirational to hear hear that you uh pressed into him as a young kid too and he and he did that for you oh yeah that's what i i, I it's kind of hard to fathom because I look back and it was like, I was just 19 and man, you know, started casting demons out of people and hearing from the Lord, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, the gift of prophecy, you know, and I mean, I didn't even know what to call those things. I remember the Lord started showing me stuff about people and, and giving me discerning of spirits and yeah, most, and then what's wild, you know, that first year, um, I worked with a guy who was a spirit filled guy and true Christian. And he got me hooked up with stuff like Leonard Ravenhill and Keith green and yeah, uh, David Wilkerson. And, you know, I mean, I got the good stuff in the beginning and, uh, and that was really good, but I was just, I was reading the Bible every day and praying and that's all I knew to do. And I, I couldn't go to church because the guy that hired me actually hired me so he could go to church on Sunday. So I had to work, <laughs> but that was nice. One of the best things that ever happened to me, because that first year of coming back to Jesus 100 percent, I didn't need any indoctrination from any denomination. I needed to just know the scriptures and know him. And once I got that down, some that the foundation of the gifts, the foundation of deliverance, the foundations of repentance and holiness and walking with the Lord. And I, you know, I'm like, wow, I mean, I came back to, you know, Alabama in November of uh, November 1st, actually, of 1987, when I came back here and to witness to all my family and friends, because I had been quite the party, drug, drinker, fighter. You know, I mean, it, it, my, my, here. my friend said, let me tell you, my best friend that I grew up with when I came back. Now, this guy knew he knew that something had happened to me, but he, he still kind of laughed and mocked because I sent him some letters about what had happened to me I because mean, we grew up together. So I come back that first day and we go over to his house, a big bunch of my friends get together. We play basketball. Of course, they're breaking out the beer and offering me beer. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. And I'm shooting basketball with them and just hanging out with them. Right. Later, later on, like a, a week later or so, my friend Craig that I grew up with, he said, you know, and he and he didn't have churchy churchianity. He didn't have, you know, Christianese. He, this is what he said to me, though. He said, I looked into your eyes and this is somebody that knew me. And he said, it looked like somebody had cleaned you up on the inside mm. and, and turned a light on. And he said, I believe I, it. He said, I knew you were different. And he went to hear me preach the first time I ever preached in a church, which was about a week later and gave his life to Jesus that night. And he's a pastor to this day. Wow. Uh, but that is that is that's how powerful it was. And 
you know, when I came back, uh, I came back and started finding out, you know, there's all this religion. This is these false doctrines like once saved, always saved. And, oh, the gifts have ceased and they uh, it ceased with the apostles or ceased when the canon of Scripture came back. And I started hearing all these, you know, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Calvinist, cessationist doctrines. And I was like, what Bible are these people reading? You know, I, I was just I tell you the truth at 19, 20 years old. I was in shock that the church world didn't just believe the book. Didn't yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we're going to get to some of these false doctrines and maybe just hit a laundry list a little bit later. But I, I'm with you. I, I, I never could fathom how people could shun because I was experiencing the Lord even as a young man. You know, these ex actual real encounters with the Lord. And I could never fathom that that people who say they believe in him do not understand how alive he is because he's the living god and and not only that it's to me being coming from that place of kind of a needing a father figure i i when i found him and he started speaking to me it was it was really my most treasured thing i had and so for anybody to ever come against that i think that's probably why he's put me in the place i'm in is for for anyone to come against his voice to me is i, I don't want to say fighting words because I, I really don't like i'm not into fighting or anything but i i will say it's it's a large uh it's a large infraction to me because he's spoke he the whole bible is a book of people who all heard from him and all had consistent encounters with him and they tell us in bible school growing up that we should look up to these guys but for them to say that in one breath and then say he's not doing those things in another, it's I do I don't even know what to call it. I know what it is. It's it's the spirit of Antichrist. It's the one that resists the Holy Spirit. It's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit if you do it your whole life. So I, I don't really like that. But um right. you know, people people just need to you know, if we come to him humbly with the childlike heart, he is faithful to show up. You right. know, and, and if we repent, you know. Right. He promised. He said, if we would, if he would, and I read this this past Sunday, you know, Jesus promised in, in John 14, if we would keep his words, we would walk with him in obedience, that he would manifest himself to us. Mm. And then he promises that he would send his Holy Spirit and he would speak to us and lead us into all truth and show us things to come. And, you know, I don't even understand a Christianity that doesn't believe that Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Uh, I mean, it's it to me. Yes, the scriptures are number one. And that's what we go by. Like, but like I've told people when I was in Washington, D.C. in 2008, there's nowhere in the Bible. It says, Dean, go to back to your hometown, back to the Oklahoma, Auburn area and start a church there. That's not written in the Bible. So how, <laughs> how, how, how would I know to do what he wanted me to do if he couldn't speak to me? And then by the witness and peace and presence of his spirit, let me know, uh, give me assurance that it was him. And, uh, you know, I tell people all the time, it's while the Lord's give just an example. He speaks this to me. He tells me that the church actually that I was I had started, but then there was another pastor and I went and actually went to work there. So they were paying me a salary and I had a two year contract. Then I started finding out there were serious moral issues in that church. So I started to confront them and I said, Lord, you know, when I confront these things, they're going to fire me. And he said, yes, they're going to fire you effective on November 30th. And when they do, I want you to go back home to your hometown and start a church. Well, I kind of put that in the back burner. That was never spoken out loud. I never said any, not a word to anyone, not even my wife. I just put that in the back burner and said, okay, no joke about a week later i get a phone call from a friend of mine that lived here in the auburn opelika area and he said you know if you ever came back here to start a church i know a group of people would be interested in and i was like wow okay you know and then sure enough i fly home i'm actually my wife is still in georgia she's getting ready to move to dc i fly home to georgia at the time we're living just south of atlanta and i fly there for thanksgiving with a round trip ticket to go back even though I had this, the Lord telling me November 30th, they're going to fire you. Sure enough, no joke. Right before I flew back home, the next day I was supposed to get on the plane to fly back to D.C. I got an email. I still have the email where they said, we are firing you effective November 30th. You're terminating our contract with you. And I was like, OK, I, I know what I'm supposed to do. But 
having said that, if I didn't know, if we didn't have the Holy Spirit to teach us, to lead us, to guide us into all truth, to speak to us and show us what to do, I don't, I don't know what kind of Christianity these people are are practicing. Because I like, I got in a debate with this pastor. I was visiting a, some friends with some friends down in Miami, and this pastor friend of theirs came over, and and he's a cessationist. He don't believe the Holy Spirit speaks to people anymore. And so I said, well, let me ask you, because he had just taken the the senior pastor job at this particular particular church there in Miami, and I said, let me ask you a question. I said, how do you know that God wants you to pastor that church? If he didn't speak to you and tell you. How do you know that because if you don't have any leading of the Holy Spirit, then it could just be you deciding I'm taking this job or it's just people's good decision. career path. Yeah. You know, you know, he had no answer for me. You you went straight to the heart. The Lord, the Lord gave you the right question because yeah. because you went straight to the heart before he ever went to seminary, a.k.a. cemetery. Um, you know, to to get all of the spirit sapped out of him, maybe maybe he did have a earnest desire that caused him to go into it. And your question probably caused him to lose a few hours of sleep. Honestly, <laughs> I can tell you, he got really quiet, and pretty much our discussion didn't go much longer after that because he had no answer. Yeah, uh, he he's and, not used to hearing things from that place. <laughs> right. But that, that to me, again, I tell people all the time, you know, one of the main messages I have preached for 37 years, man, going on 37 years, is we must all seek the Lord Jesus and hear from him and do his will for our lives. That's that's the most important thing in the world. And of course, living our lives according to the scriptures. Yes, 100 percent. And then finding exactly what he wants us to do and doing that and being willing to when he says it's time to lay that down and go do something else to be willing to like abraham who heard the, the lord go sacrifice isaac your only son and he as he obeyed and got on that mountain and then the lord speaks to him and says don't do it i it was just testing your heart now go go do this we've got to be able to be the children of abraham and be like Abraham. And yes. That, hear his voice and be led by his voice. And uh, and in his voice, if it's truly the Lord God Almighty speaking to us, he will never tell us to do anything that's immoral or contrary to the scripture. Never will. No. And, you know, concerning sacrifice in general, multiple times in my life, he's asked me to literally just burn it all, to lay it down. Every time I've laid it down, he has taken it from me, watched my reaction, and I know he's watching, and then he's restored it to me in a better manner. And 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 it's not even like he wanted to take it away in the first place, but he wanted to see how far I was willing to go. And every time it's done nothing but deepened everything that I've laid down. And, you know, the, the fire of the altar... Uh, cleanses cleanses everything we put on it so it's it's a, actually a blessing to sacrifice that's that's what maturity ends up beginning to teach us and I, I'm learning every day but I sacrifice is beautiful uh, truly is beautiful yeah well you know here's the thing that I think a lot of even ministers don't think about is that even the ministry maybe what the Lord has us doing there's a point where it can become an idol itself and the Lord will sometimes say, okay, lay this down. I love the story how you know, God used David Wilkerson to, to, you know, to start one of the greatest uh, teen uh, rehab ministries that's ever been, Teen Challenge. I mean, they had an 85% success rate in getting people off the street, off of hard drugs and getting them to walk with Jesus and stay free. And here he builds this massive, successful Teen Challenge Ministry, and the and the Lord speaks to him and tells him, put it all down, and and turn it over to the assemblies of God. I'm gonna have, and then had him leave the assemblies of God, and say it, basically, y'all run it. It's yours. I'm done, and go seek him for six months to find out what the next thing was. And that's when God spoke to him to start Times Square Church, and but that's what I'm talking about. He was just a a pastor, you know, a, a small Pentecostal pastor in Pennsylvania with a little bitty church. 
and he he opens Life magazine and sees all the gangs and the violence and the drugs and everything that was going taking over New York in that time period, and the Holy Spirit moved on him go preach to them. I, you know, we we a lot of people know that famous story, the cross and the switchblade. But you think about it, it was all because a man was willing to pray, and be led by the Holy Spirit and be used by the Holy Spirit. And like I said, there's nowhere it says David Wilkerson go preach to the gangs in New York. But the Holy I know Spirit, I know a place where it says something that just trumps all of those people who say that though. It says all the books in the earth could not contain the works that our savior performed and for the people and you know that alone it's like you you know i would i would uh, pose that as a question back to them so i guess jesus didn't do any of those works because they're not solo scriptura guys <laughs> right, uh, <laughs> right. and, and look i know both you and i we've talked enough and we know i mean we're both all about the scriptures and, and yep. doing things according to the scriptures and being faithful to the word of god and to sound doctrine um, yep. but, but again that means if we're going to do that that means we also are not going to shut ourselves off to what it says about the holy spirit gifts and leading and supernatural things casting out demons speaking with new tongues, unknown tongues, interpretation of tongues, the gift of prophecy. Uh, you know, I had to explain to somebody today, just because I said, I'm going to be on with uh, Dalton Gray, a fellow brother and prophet, you know, and they're like, you think you're a prophet? And I'm like, uh, you have a problem with that? I mean, <laughs> I mean, well, then, <laughs> there's such a line there. Of course, I've never seen you walk in a room and say, I'm Prophet Dean Odell with, you know, the big old badge, you know, like some of these ultra Pentecostal churches do. Um, and I don't do that either. But I am I am definitely convicted of the Lord, especially now that I know that my life is consecrated and I'm and I'm I'm walking fully in the calling. It's it's like the Lord does not want us to shy away from the fivefold. He if it were if it were his way in the modern church. We would all know who we were in Christ at all times, and we would not be ashamed to be, just be who we are and accept our brother for who they are, and and help us help each other grow in each of our callings. Well, the need listen, we know that the I I will call it the extreme charismaniac church world has gotten off in all those you know tight. They're about titles and they're about all this stuff, but just because they're they've gotten off into error and and you know created this whole prosperity gospel and all this other nonsense they've done it it still doesn't diminish that ephesians 4 says god has god has given the church apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers until we come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the son of god and to a perfect man well i ask everybody is the church unified are we in unity um are we a perfect mature body of believers yet no so then that means he said until then so that means all of these ministries apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers is still for the church and then you read the book of acts acts 13 there were certain prophets and teachers in antioch you read that there's there's at least mentioned 23 apostles mentioned in the new testament well not only that uh over in antioch it says that's the first time they use the term christian so the first thing that happened in christianity according to scripture is a bunch of prophets walk on the scene and right. warn of a famine and they didn't call them doom and gloomers they listened to them right. and, and guess what they all were fed because they listened and they said look hey here's agabus the prophet here's philip the evangelist here's you know paul the apostle here's here's barnabas was an apostle he was called the apostle so you know, again, it's not it's not about trying to be something. It's just trying to do what God's called you to do. And, you know, at, at one point or another, you know, when I first came back to the Lord, the Lord used Jeremiah chapter one. And just one day I was one night I was reading it and it was like the Holy Spirit poured a warm bucket of oil over my head. And it just went down and the Lord spoke to me as I'm reading Jeremiah chapter one. And he tells me that he had called me to be a prophet to the nations. And that here I am 19 years old when this is happening. And, and I'm saying, Lord, I'm too young to do this. I don't even know what this means. That happened and, to me, too, at 19. That's when it happened. And what did Jeremiah say? I'm a child. I don't know how to speak. I don't know how to do this. And the Lord said, you know what? You'll speak to who I tell you and who I send you to speak to. 
Oh and, man, you're you're bringing back memories. When it happened to me, it was exactly like that. It was just, it was I was trembling and crying and like, why did you give me this? I was, I was shook. You completely shook, and I'll never forget. You know the moments, and it was multiple moments where he first baptized me in the Holy Spirit, and then in succession he started to reveal the type of calling and the type of anointing and the type of you know, uh, the type of gifts that I would be called to work in. And every time he would come to me, it was very sovereign, like you're describing. It was like, you will do this and you belong to me. And I would be trembling. And <laughs> and let's just say, I'll just be honest, true prophets, most of the true prophets in the New Testament church right now are mostly unknown. They're not about flash. They're not about you know, trying to tell somebody their phone number or their address and all this stuff that you can pull off the internet. It's not, what's, <laughs> it's not what they're about. In fact, if you're a true prophet, I believe this, if you're a true prophet, God's going to send you to speak clear words of sometimes rebuke, sometimes correction, sometimes instruction to give direction or uh, to reveal a sin or a problem working in a church or with a pastor and God will send you to pastors and to other prophets sometimes and to evangelists. And if you're a true prophet, you're pretty much not going to be liked by most. Well, you're you're preaching to the choir over here. I've been through it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, if you're truly faithful to speak what the Lord says to whom he says to speak it, you will be hated by a, a big portion of the church world. That's just the way it is. You won't be loved. You won't be on, you know, they won't be having you on, um, you know, Daystar most of the time and other things like that. Do you? They were about to have me on one of those big ones. And, and the guy called me three days later and said, uh, we can't have you on here because he watched some of my words on my channel. And, and the words are sovereign words. And I don't think they believe in sovereign words anymore because there's a difference between, obviously, you know, a conditional word and a sovereign word. And, and the Lord oftentimes gives me sovereign words, especially even in personal prophecy. It's like, hey, you did this in your past, and it's still on your account with God, and you've never dealt with it. And if, normally, if you say it in love, the person will immediately be moved in tears. And you, you can insert the Holy Spirit there. And then, and then from that point, you, you, can, you can move, and, and powerful healing comes, and forgiveness comes, because administering... The forgiveness of, of Christ is part of the priesthood, you know, and, and bringing that forgiveness to people. And so when we do that, the breakthrough comes. But but it's things that uh, your average person would not want to bring up because it's often awkward. It takes a lot of courage to say these things. Uh, and, and it does cut straight to the heart because it's actually the real word of the Lord, uh, which is truly a sword. And, uh, you know, he to do surgery, you got to you got to do a few cuts. And, and the, the Word of God really does do that. And uh, obviously learning, learning the skill uh, of, of, of bringing the healing uh, with the Word is, is, a, is a process. But um, I'm not one of these that will ever water down or sugarcoat the Word. I've read too much Ezekiel and Jeremiah for that. So, <laughs> You know, and, and like I'll, I'll give you, an, you know, the Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians 14 that the gift of prophecy is for edification, exhortation, and comfort. Okay, well, edification is to build up, to encourage, to strengthen. Exhortation is actually to call near to Christ. And that means whatever is getting in the way between a person and Jesus, you're to, you're to expose that and then tell them, hey, get this out of the way and come near to Jesus. And so that's not always a pleasant thing. But it's also uh, to comfort people like, uh, for instance, I had a lady. This was years ago. This was, oh, gosh, probably 97 or eight, somewhere in that time period. And I was pastoring in Montgomery, my church. I started there and I, I just preached. I, I don't even remember what I preached that morning, but I gave an altar call and I was praying for some Christians that came forward. And I'd never seen this lady before. She was just visiting from Atlanta. Never seen her or her husband. I don't even know how she found our church to come to. I really don't know. And she came forward and uh, I walked over to her. And when I laid hands on her, immediately I saw a vision. I had my eyes closed and I saw it in my in my mind. And I guess you'd say it was what's called a closed vision, open visions. When your eyes are open, you see something. But I saw her standing in a grocery store aisle um, and being afraid to talk to people about Jesus. And I said, 
I see you standing in a grocery store aisle and I see you being afraid to talk to people about Jesus. And the Lord wants me to tell you to go ahead and be bold, step out and start telling people about Jesus, especially as he moves upon you. But don't be afraid. The tears were rolling down her face. Now, I have no idea what's going on here, right? Well, come to find out before she visited that morning, she had prayed to the Lord and told her husband, where are the men of God anymore that hear from him and minister basically mm. to God's people? And so what I find out is after I'd gone down and prayed for others and came back to her and, and she testified, she said, I just took a job as one of those people in the grocery store aisle that gives out samples to people. And wow. I, have, I have all these people coming up to me and she was a very sensitive Christian. She was sensitive to the Holy spirit. She said, I'll feel this, this strong burden to talk to somebody that comes up to me about Jesus, but I was afraid of losing my job or offending people. And she said, I was asking the Lord, do I speak or do I not speak in this, in, in the workplace? And, and she said, you answered the question I'd asked the Lord. And that is, and that encouraged her. So see, it comforted her, it encouraged her, it exhorted her to do what the Holy Spirit was leading her to do. And that's one of the purposes of the ministry of prophets and of the gift of prophecy. It's, Amen. it's, it's uh, to help the body become what it's supposed to be. All, and all well, of us need that help. Bringing the awareness to people of the living nature of God and the fact that he wants to speak with them and he intimately cares for their personal details is is a beautiful thing and i i love more than anything like out of the whole prophetic ministry one of the top things i love to do is help people to learn to hear god's voice because you know a true prophet is going to empower people to get closer to him personally uh, the the charlatans act like they have some special revelation that you've got to go to them. And by all means, I believe apostles and prophets do carry some power gifts uh, more commonly. Uh, but I believe all those gifts are available to everyone yes. uh, at I mean, all times. Well, that's and, what Paul says. Yeah. You all may prophesy one by one. Yeah. I mean, I was reading that in First Corinthians 14 today. I was like, you know, it's not limited. Just because someone's called to be a prophet you know they may, they're just going to do some of these things more frequently and they, and, and they have to serve more the least is the greatest right as in you know if you're called to a certain office you're signing up for extra sacrifice and a lot of people don't realize that you can't have one without the other you know right. god has to beat you up and i know he's beat me up in my life <laughs> brother <laughs> i'm getting beat up right now i can tell you i've been going through one of the biggest fiery trials of my life in the last few years. So, mm. uh, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm even sitting here talking to you by the grace of God. You know, I mean, I have, uh, I have, uh, I've had a physical issue where I've lived in pain basically for three years. It's interfered with my sleep. And yet in the same time period, God's had me pray for people and cast demons out of people and people have been healed of stuff while I'm dealing with this. But sometimes we have to walk through, certain fires and God doesn't immediately relieve the issue. So, and I think that's what I'm saying when you're saying that, yeah, it's it, true, true fivefold ministry is not, I'm the big shot. It is literally, you just have a heap more responsibility put on you and you're going to be held even more accountable, but all of God's people can hear his voice, be led by the Holy Spirit, and have the gifts of the Spirit operating them. They may not be, are all prophets? No. Are all evangelists? Are all apostles? Are all teachers? No. Not everybody has the same gift emphasis, but we can all walk in the same leading and revelation and uh, experience it with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I believe that 100%, man. And that's you know, what I, I, I encourage I got, people. I, go I, ahead. I, say, I encourage people all the time. That's what they need. People, to, to people, for instance, people are so hungry for a church. I, they, all the time they're saying, I want to move to Alabama and go to your church. I said, ah, no. I said, you make sure that you hear from the Holy Spirit about that because I don't want you to come here and it not be what God wants for your life. He may want you to stay right where you are. He may have somewhere else for you to go. I don't know that. 
you've got to figure that out between you and the Lord. So, yeah, at Stones of Zion, uh, you know, we're we're building a, a refuge, and there's been miracle provision. Uh, we're going to the mountains. We're not going to be too far from you where we're going. Uh, and and I was called to do this at 19 with an angel visitation, and and the Lord is bringing it to pass, and He's brought the right people, but. People call me kind of out of fear of, of, you know, some of the things we know are coming, especially people who follow real prophets and real prophecy. Um, you know, it's it's not all sunshine, rainbows, and Teletubbies. And, and uh, so basically, I, I tell people the same thing. It's, it's if the Lord has not fully confirmed and convicted you that not only should you move at all, but you should be talking to us in general, then, then, then we can't, we can't, uh, affirm this move we can't affirm this because the people that the lord has brought on to the ministry in this stage i've noticed they're all at a position where they're bringing a whole lot of firepower to what we're doing and it's the lord's doing it in order but a lot of the people that have called in general to come be a part of what we're doing um it it turns out they just need some deliverance and encouragement and that i go straight for the heart you know and when it comes to that it's like Instead of thinking about even even though we know these things are coming, we go straight to the heart of why have you been afraid? What's your family issue? You know, the Lord will begin giving me words of knowledge and we'll get to the heart of it. And then after we talk, they're like, you know what? The Lord has confirmed I'm right where I need to be. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of knew that already, but I was going to let you come to that conclusion. You know, uh, but yeah, just what you said. Um it is very true. Uh, we can't we can't make moves out of out of haste or fear, uh, and and also we need to be confident that we hear the Lord on little things daily before we start making the most drastic moves. And and we need to jump in the training process. And today is the day. You know, it we all have the ability to hear the the living God. Colossians says that all things were made by Him and for Him, and they consist and exist. In, in him and so you know he's omnipresent and so for us to think we're too far away from him to hear his voice that's that's our first problem and uh, once we learn to hear him on little things daily then we graduate and we're, we learn how to go left and right uh, every every second of every day um, but you know I wanted to tail in some of the subjects we had on the on the list because uh, I I love talking these so I could just go on you know free flow with you for a minute I love talking to you um, now I'm just gonna say when when we met I'm just gonna shortly address that I had just opened stones of Zion uh, organization and things just started just started blowing open and I knew the order of the body of Christ um, that I needed to find some elders you know some people that had been at it and I needed if I'm gonna really go full force in this like I knew I was called that I had to have some mentorship and some people I can call on and I'm, and I am very picky um, because the next subject will be uh, global vision and Greg Locke um, this is one example I have been in the whole uh, church world since I was young and the Lord's given me words at every church I've been to I've been kicked out of a few for uh, rebuking pastors for things like the preacher rapture and all of that stuff um, and pa these people loved me by the way I was never just a rogue individual I was normally a cool kid on the worship band but the Lord would give me words and I would be courageous enough to say them and then all of a sudden they think I'm a demon so I gotta go just because I don't believe in the preacher rapture um, but, you know, besides all that, I was at Greg Locke's church for about two, two and a half years. I was on the worship team. I was running front of house sound uh, as well. So I kind of rotated. I would either play guitar and do background vocals or run sound or run monitors, all that stuff. When Greg was still in the little, the little building, you know, that uh, when you pull up on the property before, before COVID, that's when I started going there before the whole thing blew up and the first word I gave Greg was that the Lord had heard the prayers of his wife who at that point was definitely seeking out the the spiritual depths a little more than him and uh, and I said because of the prayers of your wife and and the faithful in your church he's going to bring his miracles to your church but it's gonna come through people that you don't expect and you need to submit to that when it comes because the people you want 
are not going to necessarily be the people that God chooses. And um, that's the word. I, that was the first word I gave him. And yeah. and he told him that he told me, well, Dalton, three people have said that to me today, and and it came to pass. You know the 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 charismatic movement started happening there and then the deliverance thing started happening the tent thing started blowing up you know it 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 really started moving and uh you know the second the second big word i gave him a few others in between but the second big word i gave him was whenever the deliverance thing broke out i had a dream and jesus came to me in the dream just full out right there sitting next to me on their church property on a bench outside of their office and he looked at me very sternly and he said you must tell them this immediately uh, and and of course I did but he said they must baptize in my Holy Spirit in the order that my scriptures say before they go chase all of these spiritual things so uh, I, I messed up the uh, exact wordage at the end, but his, his message was they must administer the baptism of the Holy Spirit to the congregation before they go chasing every demon in hell. Yeah. And so I went to tell him that, and um, he told me again that three people had told him the same word and that I definitely heard it from the Lord and he would consider that. But I, I stopped him. I said, well, Greg, you can't miss the second part of what I said is Jesus was stern when he said this, as in, if you do not do this sacrament, which the early church treated that as a sacrament of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you do not put that in force and teach that before you tackle the demons, it's going to end up happening, but it's going to start being disorderly. And it started to be disorderly, um, you know, and... And at that point, I, I I didn't go there anymore. I do love them, and really, the hatred and and the vitriol that happens in the body of Christ, the Lord's rebuked me for you know even uh, any pride and arrogance I've ever had. So I just want to say I love Greg Locke, and I've seen him be humbled over and over. The Lord does does work on imperfect people, but you know, anyways, I I say this to dovetail into. Number one, I've kind of been through it on the on the whole church and the prophetic realm. But also, uh, not long after that, I discovered Dean was going to speak there. And, um, you know, I was fired up because when I left Greg Locke's church, I was at a, a crisis again. I, and I just started our ministry as well. And I, I was leaving there with a little church hurt because I loved them so much. And I didn't leave in any bad blood. I was just like, I'm not going to be a part of a bunch of newbies at deliverance, you know, that won't listen to experienced people. You know, I was I was not doing it. Uh, and so, you know, I started delving into Rob Skiba and going deeper. And I heard about Flat Earth. And, you know, I told the Lord immediately, this is dumb. And I unfollowed him and Midnight Ride and all sorts of people. I was like, I'm not listening to this. Lord, this is dumb. And I told him that I speak very honestly to God because he speaks very honestly to me. So even if I'm frustrated or mad at him, I just tell him. And then he normally brings me to my knees <laughs> or he'll or he'll make me cry really fast. But, uh, you know, basically I prayed, though, because the spirit checked me and I was like, if this is true, if this is something I need to learn about, Lord, I humble my own mind and I let let your mind live in me and let mine die. You know, that's such a powerful prayer. Anytime anybody wants to know anything in the universe, we must realize that the spirit of all knowledge and all truth and all wisdom is given to us. So as long as we die to our own selves, we can receive his knowledge about things. So, you know, I know that secret. I know that key. So I applied it when I felt that little prick and I was like, all right, Lord, if I don't, if I'm ignorant here, go ahead and show me. Within a week and a half, I believed in biblical cosmology. And as soon as I figured out you were going there and I had just opened the ministry and I had also listened to a lot of your stuff, I was like, this is a man that I want to meet and I just want to see if somehow the Lord will convict him. I actually asked the Lord to convict you to uh, accept, you know, just some sort of friendship or mentorship uh, because I need it, you know, as a minister, you know, 
And I asked him to do that. And then I went there and I know I probably came on strong. I have a tendency to do that. But uh, yeah, so from your perspective, it wasn't too strong, brother. Okay, good. From your perspective, I meet you there, and and then from for, let's go from there. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, uh, most everybody knows what happened. You know, it's it's interesting what happened between me and Greg because really I didn't know anything about him. I just seen a few blurbs, videos beforehand, and then I I did a message on I think it was called America and Her Prophets, where I was just kind of going through. I was so sick of. The prophets that were around Trump that were completely off in their end time theology, dominionist kingdom now, seven mountain nonsense. And I was just like, and so I, and then so many of them have gone through multiple divorces, multiple wives. And you're just like, okay, enough's enough already, you know, and you're just like, what's, what's the deal. And so I was just kind of going through kind of a general thing. And I just had happened to come across somebody mentioned to me or sent me something about I didn't even know Greg Locke had gone through a divorce. I didn't know anything. And I so as I'm going through this list, I just throw his name in there as here's one that, you know, divorced his wife and married his secretary or assistant or whatever and went on down the line. I really didn't spend any time on it. Well, there were people that listened to me and listened to Greg and that. So I got some people saying, why did you talk about Greg like that? And I'm like, I don't know. The next thing I know, I'm getting an email from Greg, Pastor Greg. And he's like, you know, saying you don't know what went on and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, and so, you know, I kind of just said, well, I, when I emailed him back, I said, well, there's nothing I said that wasn't true, that didn't happen. You know, I mean, I, I truly, I don't know the whole story and I don't know everything that went on behind the scenes. And so the movie come out in Jesus name, it just come out. And I knew I had to go see it because I've been doing deliverance since the beginning, you know, of my ministry. So I wanted to see if they were on target or off or whatever, but the Lord, you know, wanted me. So we took a big group to go see come out in Jesus name. And it was during that the Holy spirit really came on me and said, there is sincerity in him. And mm -hmm. he does have a desire to help people. Yep. He wants to see people to be set free. And the Lord said, I want you to apologize to him. And so I sent him a, another message and said, Hey, look, you know what? You're right. I don't know the whole story. It's not my place to, to condemn you over what I don't know everything. Right. I said, but I just know the Lord wants me to apologize to you. And, and, and he told me, he said, and I, you know, we have this in emails and text messages that it, that brought him to tears about a week later, the Lord has me move upon me to invite him to come speak to our, at our conference skyfall, which, Basically, what we deal with at Skyfall is, well, we, you know, we have speakers that speak on all kinds of topics, but primarily we deal with end time Bible prophecy and biblical cosmology. Yeah. So the Lord kept laying on my heart to ask him to come. And I finally obeyed and asked him and I couldn't believe he he said he would do it immediately. And I thought, wow, OK, well, this is interesting. He comes. He was very humble. He was he his message was very anointed. In fact, he talked about not only deliverance, but he talked about his baptism in the Holy Spirit. He actually taught about how he was baptized and how he'd been against that. His message at our conference, if you go back and watch it, was very anointed by the Holy Spirit. Well, I've then, seen I've seen him be really on, and I've seen him not control his tongue and slander people. You know, I've, oh, I've seen yeah. I've seen everything. So I, I believe it. I've seen I have been brought to tears. You know, during his sermons, plenty of times. And, and, you know, here's the thing. I thought, well, okay, then he's real nice. He goes, I really want y'all to come to my deliverance conference. It was coming up. So my wife and I went. And we were there for that. and Not to speak, but just, you know, we were there. And then he and I were scheduled. That was in, I guess, August something. And then we were, he and I were both scheduled to speak at the same conference in South Carolina um, in September. And so uh, we got, we talked there again. And that's where I had a talk with him about, now, I've never talked to him about the biblical cosmology issue. I talked to him about some of the people around him that I felt like were, you know, I wrote the book, The Polluted Church from Rome to Kansas City, that deals with some of the problems within the charismatic Pentecostal church, the counterfeit, the false, uh, you know, just the contemplative mysticism and all this stuff that, that, that IHOP fully embraced. The Cool Kids Club. Yeah. And I, and so I told him that we were standing, he was standing at my book table and I told him, I said, I really want you to read this book. And I put, I said this one. And he said, he said, I'm going to have to get that from you. I said, I already gave it to you. But I said, you got people around you that are not good. 
and they're going to, and I said, you just came into this charismatic Pentecostal thing. I said, I've been in it over 30 years. I said, I can tell you there's some minefields that you don't know about yet. And, you know, we talked about that. And in what was interesting, I thought, I really felt like God brought us together for a purpose. Like God put me in his life for a reason. And so what was wild is that we, you know, after that, I think we text a couple of times and chatted, whatever. And the next thing I know, he's blowing up, going off in his, you know, rant against flat earth and flat earth. I saw that. And, 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 and immediately, of course, all these people who know, I, you know, know me and know you that I had him speak at our conference and you're going, did you see this? Did you hear this? I mean, so that started, I, I, I privately started messaging him and said, look, I said, Hey, I wish you would not have, you don't, you don't have to comment folks like this. I said, I said, you know, and I'm one of the pastors and one of the foremost teachers on this. And then I put out a book that's got nearly 500 pages. And I said, and I've been studying this and preaching on this stuff for the last eight years. I said, you could have at least, we could have had a private conversation first. You don't have to agree with me, but you don't have to come at people like this. You can understand, try to understand where people are coming from on what they believe the scriptures teach about this. Well, if you remember, you know, I'll just insert this real quick. Uh, and, and this is Holy Spirit led. This isn't just my assertion here. Um, his son is the one who brought it to his attention. And, and, and I believe his son was truly truth seeking. And the Holy Spirit put it on my heart that, that through his son, he was trying to bring that truth to Greg. Uh, out of the mouth of babes, you know, it, uh, the foolish to confound the wise, you know, that sort of thing. So I, one of the comments he made in his rant was that his son's not worthy to, uh, to preach to a, an outhouse. Yeah. And, and that was in regards to, the, to, to that, uh, that his son was trying to bring him this truth. And, uh, you know, I, I bring that up just saying that it, it, that's, that's where my heart was pricked. I was like, man, you're going to, you're going to put your son down when God was trying to use your own son to bring you this truth because he had an open heart. So yeah. that, that bothered me a little bit. Yeah. And you know, and, and I, you know, again, like I say, I have all the texts to prove what I'm saying. I, I have no, I have no problems even putting that out there. I mean, but I, you know, we had some texts back and forth and I said, look, you know, I'm just having, trying to have a private conversation with you. And he got real kind of snotty with me in the text. message, like, I ain't going to go back and forth, but I said, and I told him in the text, I said, you're not going to go back and forth on me with me on the scriptures because I will destroy you. <laughs> and you did. <laughs> you know? And the next thing I know, he's announcing publicly that he is challenging me to a debate. He never said anything to me privately. It was like after this little text message. And sure enough, I get wind of it right before he does it on Wednesday night. I'm talking about like an hour or two that he's going to do this. What oh, wow. One of his church members told me and I was like, really? So instead I, I, pa I, we were at our Wednesday night prayer meeting. I paused everybody said, well, pray in a minute. I put on Greg live on my phone. So we listened to him make this challenge to me live. And I texted him while he was still on the stage and said, <laughs> I will be there. <laughs> yeah. This sounds, this sounds like the two leading football teams at the, in the locker room before the Super Bowl, man. <laughs> it was like, but I knew, I knew from the Lord that I was supposed to do it. I, and, and, uh, and so I, but the, I knew too, the Lord warned me beforehand that it wasn't going to go well at the end. That's and, what I got in my spirit as well. The Lord, the Lord had me warring against, uh, I would say, honestly, if you just want to ask me what spirit, it was Satan. Uh, you know, it was a level of spirit there that, uh, you know, I, I've, I've fought him before, but it wasn't just a, a regular demon. Like the, the, the evil one was there to make a mockery of God. And, um, and I knew he was there. I sensed it beforehand and I was, I was having chest pains and, you know, doing the prophetic spiritual warfare the whole time. I was also physically attacked by one of his church members when I was there. I never told you about that, wow. but I, nothing against him. It was, it was not his fault. This guy just didn't like that. We were in the back row kind of like 
me and a couple other co biblical cosmology guys were just literally between ourselves cracking a few jokes. And this guy turned around, slapped my phone out of my hand, and just tried to start a fight, and security got him out of there. But, you know, nothing against anybody. I'm not saying that to stir anything up. I... I said I, I said I forgive you as he was doing it. I didn't. Yeah, it yeah. Is what it well, is. And, and you yeah. know, and that's and, and you know, here's the thing. I know for a fact that it, it's wild because I've had more people come to me. I mean, I've had people that said I didn't agree with you. I thought this was silly. I thought you know these are Christians that even members of his church who were not believers in flat earth biblical cosmology they they said after we heard your presentation we see it's biblical. And I've had more people say, I watched that. And they said, yeah, I, I, they it even told me what Greg's part was torturous to them. But they said that I've laid it out so clearly from the scriptures. And I left out tons of my slides that I had. I know how much you left out because I've watched everything you've done. And I, I knew what you were about to get to. And he was yeah. going to, he wasn't going to like that either. <laughs> no. and, and you know, what's interesting is he talks about, he, he used the Bible and I didn't and all this baloney. People counted and said that I use forty plus scriptures and he used five or six. I mean, and none of none of his were uh, translated and and broken down correctly either. No, no, and and so you know I know I mean I I knew going in I was completely confident and knew that biblically I was going to destroy him that he had no ground to stand upon. I even warned him ahead of time it's not going to go well because you you don't you don't even know where we're coming from and uh i said you know it would have been better for you to just take some time and learn a little bit before you decided to do this but anyway long story short what made me mad though was i think that there was people around him that planned a setup and and really planned to like january 6 us as the, that's exactly what the vibe i got yeah yeah and uh, because the press release that they released afterwards saying that our people were out in the parking lot smoking dope and uh, running into cars and they had to call the police was all lies. And we have, first of all, we only stayed out by my truck and by the front door for about 15 or 20 minutes. I was there. Yeah, in, there's, yeah. There's, yeah. there's videos of multiple people who were live streaming out there. Uh, we even we even we talked for a minute. We prayed together, and then we all left and went over to one of the hotels. I can't remember the hotel lobby, the Marriott, or one of them. And uh, we all hung out. That you know that people that wanted to hang out afterwards. So when they released a press release, basically not putting. First of all, there was a, you know our church members all had on the same shirts or hoodies that had the same logo on it. We had, you know, we know none of our people that either we invited or was with us did any of those things. Nobody got aggressive, nobody, everybody just walked out with me. And now there were uh, flat earthers who were there who are unsaved and some of them got loud, but nobody charged the stage. I mean, goodness, they've got guards with, with you know, uh, AR-15s, nobody's charging the stage. Yeah. And so all of that, when that press release was put out, I told him, I, well, I said publicly, so this is just slanderous lies. None of this happened. So well, yeah, well, to, to preach, to preach and see a fellow minister work in the gifts of deliverance and healing and the wisdom that, that I know you carry. And then despite even a disagreement like that, which is non-salvational and that was stated by both of you beforehand uh but to act like that it's it's a large infraction against the holy spirit and the lord is you know real serious with me um because when you when you're slandering your fellow brothers and the work of god in their lives even if you don't understand it it's better you keep your mouth shut because every word you speak every idle word you're going to be held accountable for but especially every non-idle word where you are intentionally saying something about somebody uh, and you might actually just simply be speaking against God himself because if the, the works a brother is doing are the works of God you are actually speaking against the Holy Spirit even if it even if you don't understand it fully yeah you know and that's why we must be careful and we must we must err on the side of caution with our mouths I, that's what I, I think that's what bothered me the most and you know I contacted him afterwards, you know, and I said, 
I said, look, I know for a fact that there was nobody, uh, none of our group that was outside afterwards were smoking dope in the parking lot. Nobody's running into cars. I said, but you didn't put any difference between our group, the Christian group, and the unsaved group. It could, some of them could have done something that I didn't know after we left. I don't know. But I said, you didn't put any difference. You basically threw us all under the bus with your press release. Charisma Magazine picked it up and shared what you put out. And I said, it was a lie. It was a misrepresentation, and it was a slander. So I have a text uh, text message from him about a week or two, well, probably about two weeks later, where he apologizes and says he apologized for calling me a Bible denier. He apologized for unkindness he showed. And he I said, we, you know, I ordered the, the media and everybody to take down those press releases. And so they removed them all, but they, he never put like a correction. He never said these things were not true. He never made the correction. Now, this is what really irritates me here. All right. So just a few weeks ago, I find out that he goes on Encounter Today. Yeah, I saw that. And which is a podcast that has 500,000 subscribers on YouTube. He goes on there and actually doubles down on, it lets him play the clip where he's calling me a Bible denier, let, makes the false accusation. I threw the microphone at him, which I did not. He knows it didn't. Well, yeah, I think you have a better football arm than that. I was a quarterback from uh, Pee Wee to college, and if I really threw it at him, it hit him between his eyes very, very hard. So I'm sure I still can throw a football. So I was like, you know that these are lies and misrepresentations. And you, I said, you know, and you, you so called. And I sent him a text after the encounter today thing. I said, you apologize for these things, and then you slander again using the same things you apologize for. You put them out again. And I just said, I said, I don't understand what, what's going on with you. I said, but I can tell you one thing that you've become a liar and a slanderer and you didn't keep your word because like he told us we could have five or six hours and all the time we needed. And, and then he acts like me taking two hours of when he told me I could have as much time as I needed as if I took the time up and stole time or something. It has been a complete dishonest like show he's put on and i really feel sorry for him because since that time it's like he has flipped out and i was just sent a clip of his sermon i don't know when he did it if he did it sunday or last week but somebody said have you seen this and i just got a clip of him basically publicly saying kenneth copeland is a satanic child abuser and he's that he has pictures i'm like yeah, he, he, he he called uh he called joel olstein a pedophile one time and with i i prophesied that that week uh at dinner after i heard him say that my gut sank uh because i knew it wasn't true in the holy spirit you know joel olstein might be might be you know he might be uh the appearance of greed may be in his life and that's for god to judge uh uh he's very inspiring if you listen to him uh but you know it's not my cup of tea um but at the same time i knew by the holy spirit that no he's not a pedophile and uh you know, within three days, the tent was taken down by a tornado after that. So, you know, that's enough. That's enough for me to not to know not to play with that sort of thing. Um, well, listen, and, I don't agree. Yeah. I don't agree with what Kenneth Copeland teaches. And I don't I, you know, I've got my own issues with him. But here's something I said. I said to the person that sent me that clip, I said, look, that's something you do not say publicly. Yeah, Unless well, that's actually illegal, too. It's It's even crossing into the American law. Uh, which is the law of the land, you know, slander and libel, uh, accusation of a crime, a high crime is actually a very serious ordeal for exactly. sure. Exactly. And, and, and I said to this person, I said, if he does have pictures, if he has incriminating evidence on Kenneth Copeland, then he shouldn't be talking about it from the pulpit. He should be g giving that evidence to the police and it should be, they should move forward with it. So what I'm saying is, is that right there is a complete lack of, uh, what do we say? Candor? Yeah, well, a lack of not just character, but a lack of uh, common sense. Or it, it's almost like he's just unhinged. And, uh, and and you know, I mean, I don't I don't know what's going on. I text him about that, inner, you know, when he did the encounter today. And I, and I text him and I said, you know, I, I expected a response because he normally would respond to me. He didn't respond. Week later, I said, so you're not going to answer me anything? Not a response again. 
And, you know, he's the one that said afterwards, oh, we'll get together and have coffee and da 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 I mean, it's just been weird. But That is strange. And, and we're dealing, we are dealing with, you know, there's, we don't fight against flesh and blood. And, and we could, I know if you and me talked off air, I'm sure we could identify the specific spirits present. And I already know a few of them that are in, involved in that. Uh, and not only spirits, but what people don't realize is, you know, it, when we when we curse our brothers, um, you know, there's obviously varying degrees of, of cursing our brothers. Uh, if it's out of ignorance, there's obviously more mercy. If it's because you're immature, there's obviously more mercy. But as you get put in a place of, of position and power and the Lord is raising you up, your words have carry a lot more weight, um, you know, to, to cast out a demon. But they also carry a lot more weight before the living God and before heaven and you're held more accountable and so there, there's only so many times you can slander and revile a brother uh, and that goes for any of us here uh, and it's something the Lord holds me accountable to as well there's only so many times you can do that um, and not expect God to send you into your own delusion or curse because it's not it's not the devils we should fear by the blood of Jesus you know we can get rid of those and repent but when God sends you a spirit of madness, uh, you're indeed going to be mad for whatever time the Lord has ordained. And that's biblical as well. That is true. Very true. Yeah. We see what happened to King Saul. We see what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, it, the Lord knows how to humble. Um, and he will be God. Well, one thing I will say, Dean, and I'm motivated to say this is, and you know this, uh, but uh, bad press is the best press and it seems like the Lord has has turned this one around, you oh, know, yeah. in yeah. general. Um, I, I, I want to move. I want to move on, you know, to some more subjects for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if we can just do kind of laundry list, laundry list of these, because we we could break each one of these down into a show, but maybe just a little bit of commentary. I wanted to go in. And by the way, I I believe you and me love our brother Greg Locke. And uh, we pray that God would have mercy on his his uh, lack of control of his tongue. And we pray that he would give him an opportunity to, to truly repent of some of these, uh, you know, slanderous words and deeds in Jesus' name. And we, we, we impart the love of God from our own hearts to him. And we ask that the Lord would just humble him, but also... There's a heart issue that I see in the spirit. And I'm asking, Lord, that, that whatever this heart issue is, that you would break through his head and just make his heart bigger than his head. And that he would he would fully see with the eyes of his heart the the infractions that he has committed before you and before his brothers. And that this would outweigh the the high-mindedness and pride that keeps him from seeing these things in Jesus name um, so um, I wanted to go over some body of Christ stuff and then we'll get into some end time stuff I, I want to finale you know you and me had a had a talk recently and you you spoke about some mark of the beast Intel so uh, you know if you if you can share a little bit of that or, or all of it I don't know what degree you can but yeah. uh, I, I was excited to to get into that maybe as the finale, but I love your um, position and your, uh, you know, your uncompromising resolve when it comes to confronting issues in the body of Christ. And, you know, these are heresies that I've had experience with as well, uh, that I've confronted, but seeing you confront them and, 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 and uh, uncover them in the way you do is motivating. It's educational to me. It helps me to do the same. Um, so I'm just going to go down a laundry list and maybe we can have a quick convo on each one, but not a full one. Um, and I've got a joke on the first one, but, uh, Hebrew roots. Oh boy. Just a little bit, Dean, just a little bit. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, that kind of, how do I put it? Really 2016, 2017, I began to see a lot of stuff online, especially coming from Rob Skiba and Rob, you know, Rob was, was going down the, the flat earth biblical cosmology road at the same time I was. We, we both kind of came into it at the same time. We did not know each other at all. Never, I never had known him. He didn't know me. Um, 
And, you know, I was loving, you know, I saw some of his stuff. He actually took a video of mine and put it beside his. And of course, you know, that blew up and, you know, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of views and stuff. And then we got to know each other a little bit more, but then what began to come out was not just, you know, I loved his stance on uh, biblical creation, but then I began to find out that he was really heavy into this whole Torah observance and Hebrew roots thing. And, and, and I've never had a problem with anybody that wanted to celebrate the feast or wanted to study, you know, the old Testament and, and understand what Passover was about or the feast of tabernacles or whatever. I, I had one of my best friends that was deep into that and on uh, all that. The problem has come is that there's a bunch of people that have taken it to the extreme and saying that if you don't keep the feast, if you don't keep the Sabbath, if you don't keep the dietary laws of the Old Testament, if you don't wear seats, zeet if you don't do all these things that are in the Old Covenant, then you're not you don't really love God and you're not keeping his commandments. And that is completely another gospel. That's completely what the apostles fought against in the beginning of the church because they had to lay the lines that what the difference between what is the old covenant and the new covenant that was what the acts 15 council was about to set down what was required of the gentiles and the new believers coming into the kingdom through faith in jesus and of course we know paul dealt with it in romans he dealt with it in the entire book of galatians he talked about the problems in colossians i mean it, it, the book of hebrews is all about that because there were hebrew christians thinking they had to go back and keep the law of Moses to be right with God or to be saved. Or in Galatians, you had to go back and be circumcised or you couldn't be saved. And so these things have been laid out that, that, that we're not required to keep the dietary laws or the Sabbaths or the feast or any of those things to be righteous or to be right with God. And that is the problem. And so that's what Galatians 5, 4 is very clear when Paul said, who, if you seek to be justified by the law, the old covenant, then Christ has become no effect to you and you're fallen from grace. So and we're saved by grace through faith. Yeah, right. And That's it's a big deal. And, you know, when the Bible talks about we must rightly divide the word of God, I tell everybody the first thing that must be divided, <laughs> rightly divided, is what is required under the new covenant. Right. I mean, I say I tell some of these Torah Hebrew roots folks, if you say we're supposed to keep everything in the Old Testament, uh, are you stoning adulterers? Are you stoning rebellious teenagers? Are, you know, are, what is your community doing that? And, and who has the authority in your community to carry those things out? And where's your Levitical priesthood and where's your animal sacrifices? But the moment they say, well, we're, we're not we don't have to have the Levitical priesthood anymore because Jesus became our high priest or we don't have to have sacrifices anymore because Jesus became our sacrifice. And they go, exactly. And the Sinai worked. covenant was the Levitical priesthood right. and the Melchizedekian priesthood had superseded that priesthood the entire time. Exactly. The prophets were all Melchizedekian priests. And why do you hear them say, the Lord does not delight in your Sabbaths or your feasts or your sacrifices, or your burnt offerings? They already got the picture because they knew the Messiah already. They were well, Melchizedekian priests. I love this about Melchizedek because Abraham was 400 plus years before the law came into being. And it says he walked with God, he was a friend of God, and Melchizedek, who was the high priest, who did not have beginning of days or end of life, but was the king of righteousness and the king of peace. We know who that is. That is Jesus. Pre Man without generations. <laughs> right. Pre-incarnate Jesus Christ appearing to him. And Jesus said, uh, well, uh, Paul said in Galatians that the gospel was preached to Abraham. Well, when did that happen? When Melchizedek, who is Jesus appeared to him and sat down with bread and wine, the Last Supper communion, and explained to him the gospel. And so Abraham, the reason that all that Paul said, all of us are children of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ, not by the works of the law. He said that because Abraham walked with God without the law, before the law. And, and, and that's why we go back and Melchizedek, you're right, was always superseded. See, David was the first one. I believe that he got a revelation that he was a priest after the order of Melchizedek because he was to birth and bring forth the, the Christ from his loins. Right. So therefore, he had to be a Melchizedek priest. And that's why he got to bring the Ark of the Covenant in his backyard without a veil and set up <laughs> and set up an entire worship team there. 
and and that why David could do a sacrifice, grab the ephod, if if he hadn't have been a Melchizedek priest, they they he should be have been killed by God. So, long story short, that true, you know, the Galatians is clear when he said. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But once we are in Christ through faith, we are no longer under that schoolmaster. And, and it's, it couldn't be plainer. And then he even talks about the allegory, the two covenants. You know, the one that was in Hagar that was in bondage. He said, that's Sinai. He said, but Jerusalem and Sarah is free. And he said, the bondwoman cannot stay with the free woman. And she was cast out. And he says these are the two covenants. And is it he, is it Hebrews eight eleven? I'm I'm pretty. It, I don't know if I'm right about that, but it says that if there if there were if the old covenant were perfect, then there would be no need for the new. And it says, let us put uh, let us put away the old, uh, which is passing away and is obsolete. Yes. You know, yes. uh, is is that Hebrews eight seven and eight? That, that whole okay. Thing. Yeah. yeah yeah and and that's the clearest it really gets it 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 clearly states that it's passing away and it's obsolete the word obsolete is used and that triggers hebrew roots people i want to tell you a little bit about hebrew roots i, I want to keep each of these doctrines short so you mean to tell me that if i light up my fancy menorah all seven candles that you, you mean to tell me that the, the seven spirits of god don't need me to light that up for them to be on fire right now you mean yeah. to tell me that that if i light these things up it won't excite the seven spirits of god too much yeah. <laughs> but but if i were to light it with a with a loving heart towards god and a big attitude of faith to honor him do you think god might show up for that yeah he's fine with that there you go there there's there's a good lesson for hebrew roots people by the way my aunt did a 23 in me and and i am I am from Judah and Levi, and we, we we are from the Polish people that that fled to the mountains of Poland. My papa's name is Lahaski. My mom's maiden name is Lahaski. It goes to Melikowski, Melik Zadok. We are from the priesthood. Uh, my family is. So I was drawn into the Hebrew root stuff at a young age. Then I did throw up my Christmas tree, and I stopped doing Easter, and I stopped doing all of it. Uh, and I actually love your teaching on Christmas trees and stuff and how he's going to have fir trees in his temple. That That's a trigger warning too, man. Um, but, uh, that series triggered some folks, yeah. Oh, man. But uh, I have a quick testimony, then we'll move to the next subject. So the Hebrew Roots thing, I was going to lead worship at this Hebrew Roots gathering, and I love my Hebrew Roots people. On the Stones of Zion property, we are going to do a Saturday Sabbath, not religiously enforced, but just to honor Moses, because I really love Moses. You know, I can't wait to shake his hand and sit under him for a minute. Um, you know, uh, but but we're gonna we're gonna do a rest on Saturday, and that's just gonna be our rest day because we need one anyways, and might as well do it. But and we're gonna celebrate, uh, you know, the the feasts. Uh, so I am all into those things, but I know that none of them make me any more righteous whatsoever. And not only that. Um, I hear from the Holy Spirit daily, and I promise you, if he was telling me to go prophesy or heal somebody or do something for somebody, and it, and the feast was getting in my way, I'd be like, y'all take care of this. I'm out. Like, I'm gone. I'm going to follow the Lord today, follow his voice. And um, anyways, besides that, I was at this gathering, and I, I led some worship, and I started prophesying to a few of them, and they were like deer in the headlights. It was like a, a Church of Christ or a Methodist church, like no Holy Spirit. But but they were really excited because they did have the desire for that. Uh, but I could tell it was very foreign to them. And so I, that was a red flag to me, number one. Number two, I went to the men's Bible study several weeks, and they started doing a teaching. And in their teaching, they said that we are not in the new covenant yet. When they said that, I heard the Holy Spirit say, damnable heresy. Mm -hmm. So when when I heard that, I never returned again, and I will not return again. And and some of the people in there didn't believe that, but I don't care. The, the Bible does say the Lord hates a mixture, and if you're around people who are not in the new covenant, you're not around saved people. 
So let me just put that out very clearly. They're not saved. If they have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, born again, and they're teaching that His covenant is not active in their lives, they are confessing a lack of salvation out of their mouth. Out of the mouth speaks the abundance of the heart, says the Lord. So I, I just I put that out there as a testimony, just that that I I agree with Dean. Um, I also have an affinity for those things and and for those people, but at the same time, the way we're we, we're the most righteous before the Lord is if we hear His voice on a second to second basis and walk with Him. And if you are walking with Him, you won't have time to sin. I put a post on my page recently. Instead of sitting here and avoiding mistakes and sin all the time, how about we just start choosing to do powerful acts in the Lord? The more we do with Him and for Him and focus on Him, the more those things fade away. Because it's Him that changes our nature anyways. It's not our own will. It's not It's not the seat seats and the and the menorahs and the all the above it's it's simply obeying him so anyways uh yeah that's enough on hebrew roots but thank you for that dean oh absolutely a lot yes. so i want to go quickly um so w let's do be real quick on this but but false prophets you know uh you know i know you uh have a great keen eye for for that as as well as do i yeah there's a lot of them i mean you know jeremiah 23 I think stands out to me the most, you know, and I've, I've had interactions with a lot of them over the last 36 years. And I'm talking about the big, big ministries from Morningstar and Rick Joyner to the, the late Bob Jones to, uh, I mean, you name it, I've been around a lot of them and uh, I have experienced the counterfeit coming from a lot of them and false doctrines. And, and it's so bad. Oh, you know, over the years, I mean, we can, it goes back into the 90s. I had one of those prophet Bob Jones actually destroy a church that I planted, a powerful church that was God was moving that I started over in Georgia time. And the Lord began to have me dig into it and, and really realize that what, what was happening is that a lot of them, some of them are Jesuit plants. I'm just going to tell you straight up. They, they have come from the Catholic church to infiltrate Protestant Christianity and pretend to be these things and operate in the supernatural it's just not the holy spirit and deceive many christians and many christians are deceived but they're you know ignatius loyola of the jesuits developed a whole system of meditation and what's called contemplative mysticism to create this visions and supernatural things and being able to do basically to operate like a psychic and claim to claim it's for the lord and so this mixture has been in the charismatic Pentecostal church world for a long time. And finally, the Lord, I, I began to see so much of it. This And it comes with this whole meditation and visualization, things that are being done that they're saying, oh, these are Christian. This is a Christian imagination. No, it's it's basically Buddhist, Hindu, uh, Sufi, Kabbalah, occultism that they're practicing and putting Christian names on it. But what this has done it's opened that entire segment of the charismatic Pentecostal church to Kundalini spirits, counterfeit demons, counterfeit supernatural things. And many have been left ship shipwrecked. When I wrote the polluted church to confront this, the Lord had made me write it, the book to confront this false prophecy movement. And I named names in it. He told me to name names. And I spoke about the problems of Mike Bickle and IHOP, not only the, the doctrinal stuff and the supernatural stuff of what they were teaching, out-of-body experiences, at will, and all this stuff. But I said, I talked about the sexual problems that had been there. Their two mentors, Paul Cain and Bob Jones, had both been in sexual sin over the years. I mean, serial sexual sin over and over again. And I knew that IHOP was going to be a disaster. And of course, in the last, what, two to three months now, it's all come out that Mike Bickle has been in sexual immorality and grooming young girls and cheating on his wife with multiple women that were part of IHOP. And that comes out that their worship leaders were in uh, adultery and in affairs. And I mean, it is a rampant problem. But I hear people talking all about that, that you know, all this stuff that's coming out about the leadership and, and sexual immorality and stuff there. I said, but most people are missing the point. When did this start? It started 
back when they embraced Roman Catholic contemplative mysticism that Mike Bickle taught and pushed. He pushed Roman Catholic mystics like Teresa of Avila, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, Thomas Merton. He got into all that, but I, I tell you the truth now, I used to think that Mike Bickle was just ignorant or he was just deceived and misled by some of these prophets. I recently found out where he admitted that he never left the Roman Catholic Church. So now I even wonder uh, if he was part of the plan all along. I don't know for sure about that, but I do know he taught Roman Catholic occult mysticism and he pushed that and he lived a double life. Not, not just not just he fell into an affair, but for 30 years he would groom young women using his position of authority, prophesying to them, saying that they were going to be his wife and his wife was going to die and they, they were going to get married. He used that line on multiple young women to get them into sexual encounters and affairs and set them up in apartments and gave them keys to his office. And I, I mean, it was it, it was not a fall. You see, it was a long term problem. And well, so, you're you're all my bells are going off in the sense of, um, you know, in the spirit I'm I'm hearing uh, and it's an easy connection to make. But I'm I'm just putting this out as I'm getting it, uh, you know, great whore, spiritual adultery, physical adultery, uh, the false anointing carrying from the fathers to the sons, uh, as in, you know, if you get your, you know, if you get uh, anointed or touched by some of these people, that, that it's going to continue to reproduce itself because it is a actual spirit. And obviously there's some spiritual adultery that manifested in their lives as physical adultery. Oh yeah. Um, and, 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 and being that he was still involved with the great whore, it actually makes perfect sense spiritually. It's kind of a no brainer actually. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's actually very sad because, you know, Jeremiah said this in his day and it's no different now. He said, my heart basically is broken because of the prophets. He said, because from the prophets, he said they have, profaneness and basically pollution and uncleanness has gone into all the land. And um, I, I hate to see what it has done, but pretty much I would say that 98 to 99% of what we think of as the prophetic prayer charismatic movement has been corrupted and polluted by these false prophets. And some of them are sincere. I happen to know somebody that knows Bill Johnson very well. A, a friend of mine is a good friends with Bill Johnson of Bethel. But Bethel now is so far off course and into all kinds of weirdness and people are getting Kundalini experience and having to go through deliverance after going there. But it's because they opened the door to those prophets like Bob Jones and others that came in. And if you look at, let me, let me just tell you, you want to know that the, the, I guess you would say, the actual biggest debacle and proof that there are there were no true prophets within the whole charismatic Pentecostal prophetic movement was Lakeland Revival in 2008 when they stood up there and it was Rick Joyner and uh, uh, Bethel Johnson, Bill Johnson and Arnott from Toronto. And it was just Shay on it and Peter Wagner. It was just the who's who of the charismatic prophetic movement and they were prophesying over todd bentley who was leading this revival in lakeland it'd been going for two months and they prophesied over him that he was he was the apostle of revival he was the next great you know uh evangelist and revivalist and miracle worker and it, that that this was going to go on and on and on. This was the beginning of the end time revival that they prophesied where billions were going to get saved and stadiums were going to be filled and the manifest sons of God were going to come on the scene and the 35 super apostles. And I mean, this is all of that stuff. Yeah, I, I, I studied that whenever it was happening for sure. But not one of them that were prophesying over Todd Bentley saw that he was committing, he was in the adulterous affair with his assistant, preparing to divorce his wife and marry his assistant while he's preaching this revival and while they're prophesying over him that he's going to be the next great prophet, 
miracle worker, healer, leader of the charismatic movement. This was the, the biggest revelation that there was not a man or woman on that stage that had any discernment whatsoever. They had nothing. That'll leave you a little doubtful, I would say. Yeah. And what's, what's bad is, is that they doubled down on it and tried to restore Todd Bentley only to find out that he was a serial adulterer and abuser and, and sexual deviant. And it all came out again and again and again. Now, I don't, I'm not beating up on Todd Bentley because I'm going to tell you what happened to Todd Bentley. I think Todd Bentley really got saved when he was young and, and he had been molested and, and he admits this and he got, he came out of gangs and a street life and all this stuff. But then he got hooked up with these people that he idolized thinking that they were true prophets and had real power and they laid hands on him. And he, and I have the video of him and Bob Jones and Patricia King sitting there talking about how Bob Jones laid hands on him. And now he's able to go out of his body and travel to the third heaven whenever he wants to. And I'm sitting here going, this is not God. This is not the Holy Spirit, but they're convinced it is. But it always ends in complete sexual sin disaster when you get hooked up with these people. And well, I that's, know that's this, the sign of, of the spiritual adultery, the other yeah. spirit that's going on. Yeah. And I know this because I made the mistake as a younger man, letting some of these people lay hands on me. And I opened the door to it, opened the door to all kinds of sexual evil sexual spirits and they tormented me and i had to if i hadn't known about deliverance i would have ended up in the same place of todd bentley and some of these other younger believers that got polluted by these prophets yeah and when i was when i was younger I, I got pulled into the bill johnson thing too and and all of that and and just as soon as i got in the lord pulled me out because what ended up happening is i got those counterfeit spirits that came on me and, and i'm very sensitive spiritually you know I, I feel my spirit man within myself you know i'm i'm very very aware all the time and i try to stay that way you know i feel like it's dangerous not to be spiritually aware um and so when these spirits came on me i could just feel them on my mind just just confusing me about everything even decisions in my own life it was these horrible spirits of confusion that got on me and it, and and it just took away the soundness of the mind in general and these are spirits of witchcraft these that's what they do and uh you know you see that those same spirits on new agers it's the same ones the ones that make them uh throw away their whole lives get in a van and and travel the world and ruin their whole life you know that that sort of spirit that just just makes you fall off the wagon you know, and so I had to go get deliverance from those things, and I didn't look back because I, I knew something was off, and uh, I, I'm in a full agreement. Um, I wanted to read this real quick, just to this is Ezekiel 13, and and it gives you the keys of false prophets, and it's so cool. It kind of if you uh, just tear it apart a little bit, it, it's the keys to identify them. It's son of man prophesy against the prophets at, of Israel who are now prophesying. Say to those who prophesy out of their own imagination. So there's key one. It's out of their own human spirit. And one of the other translations says their own spirit. Um, this is what the sovereign Lord says. So the Lord's coming in and saying, I'll give you a sovereign word, not one that's based on your spirit, one that's based on just how it's going to be. Uh, and he says, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Uh, your prophets are like jackals among ruins. You have not gone up to the breaches to repair it for the people of Israel so that it will stand firm in the battle on the day of the Lord. So key too is these prophets are not warning and they are avoiding the subject of the coming judgment and the day of the Lord. And they're building this flimsy uh, protection around their people. Their visions are false. Their divinations are a lie. Even, the, even though the Lord has not sent them, they say, the Lord declares, and expect him to fulfill their words. So there's the name it and claim it. Mm -hmm. You know, he and, and I do believe that when you speak in the Lord's will, and it's married to your will, there's power behind those words. So there is some degree of manifestation when we're speaking the Lord's will. But that's only limited to his will. It right. doesn't go beyond that. Um, and so... Anyways, there's just so many keys. Y'all go read Ezekiel 13 if you want to get some keys on that.
Let me let me read this. This is one of the scriptures, actually one of the key scriptures that I talk about in the Polluted Church book. But this is Isaiah 2, and it's verses 5 and 6. And he says, O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Now, what is the light of the Lord? It's the, the truth. The word of God is the lamp unto our feet, the light unto our path. It is the truth of the word of God, and it is the, the true leading and true anointing of the Holy Spirit. And he says, let us walk in the light of the Lord. But he says, therefore, thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they have been replenished from the east and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. Now, if you break this down, when it says they be replenished from the east, eastern religions have this meditation where you blank out the mind, where you use your own imagination, you create your own visions. You, you develop yourself to the point where you can astral project, you can leave your body at will and stuff like this. All of this comes from the East, from Hinduism, Buddhism, Kabbalah. These are, and he says they be replenished. That means they be satisfied and filled from the East. And he says what it's done, it's made them become soothsayers like the Philistines. Like they're, wow. they're, they're, they operate in divination. Yes, they can tell you your, your, your fortune. They can say some things that actually are supernatural that they shouldn't know or speak a word of prophecy and it might come to pass. But it doesn't mean that they're from the Lord. And he says, he said, this was his people doing this. And he says, you forsaken. The Lord says, I'm forsaken my people because they have done this. They have become soothsayers like the Philistines and they get their, their spiritual fullness and satisfaction from practices of the East. And this is wow. the yeah that's it's, a key that's and big. If you go back, you know you just read ezekiel 13 but if you back up to ezekiel 8 where he takes ezekiel to jerusalem he's in babylon and the, the lord takes him in the spirit to jerusalem says i'm going to show you what the elders are doing in my house and you know what they were doing they were worshiping the sun toward the east you know what that is that comes from hinduism and buddhism yoga every bow in yoga is a is a bow to the sun god and it's to be practiced in the morning facing the sunrise and so what he was saying is my leaders are in my house worshiping the sun practicing eastern religions and he said that's when he said i am about to bring judgment upon here because that's when he tells ezekiel in ezekiel 9 he says basically the angels are coming and there he said the ones doing this in my house are going to be the first ones that are killed and then he says, and then, of course, chapter 10, the glory of the Lord departs from his tabernacle and from his people, and then judgment falls upon them. And 13, he's just commentary about this is what false prophets are, and this is your problem. Yeah, it goes on to say another great key to identify a false prophet is somebody who's always saying smooth words, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And that's the majority of so-called prophets today. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a sad thing and, it, and it, you really want to believe it. And seducing spirits don't come to you in, in false skins. They, they make you feel great. Um, and, and that's the way they get in. But it goes down in Ezekiel 13 later to say that they will be cut off forever from the congregation of my people. So the Lord is saying there, he's going to throw them into hell. That doesn't say forever for no reason. And it also says in the day of their calamity, he will not hear them. It also says that the people that they that they lied to will come and they will they will ask them why uh, are, do these whitewashed walls fall? So, you know, at, at some point in the near future, when the real prophecies come true that we're going to go through economic collapse, we're going to go through war, we're going to face foreign invasions, and these are sovereign words, they're not dependent on anybody's opinion. Uh, the Lord has said they will happen. And, um, you know, when these things happen, all of the pre-tribbers are going to, are, and the Lord has shown me this, and I, my heart, I have a burden for, for them in this, but they are going to be pretty angry. They're going to be running to their church buildings, and the pastors are going to be in the vacation homes in the mountains or in the countrysides that those people's tithe money paid for. The pastors are going to be nowhere to be found, but the people are going to need answers because their pantries are going to be empty. The Lord has shown me this. And, and uh, you know, they're the very people that are paying for, for their pastors' big escape homes. Yeah. And uh, I'm not saying all of them have a heart like this, but when faced with trouble, uh, the true colors of people do come out. 
And I think a lot of people who people think are sincere are going to, in those moments of difficulty ahead, are going to be exposed for being cowards. Yeah. And uh, it's it's unfortunate. But uh, let's dovetail into some end time stuff. And, you know, I know we've been on for a while, but this is, I want a finale here. And I appreciate the time you spent too, oh, Dean, yeah, by the no, way. I appreciate it, brother. I, I, I believe this is important. Yeah. So, so Dean, uh, he's been at it longer than I have and y'all, y'all have seen my channel. A lot of you have, I've received a lot of end times visions and revelations and I make no apologies on the channel whatsoever. I say, when I hear a sovereign word from the Lord, I say, Hey guys, unfortunately this is going to happen and I'm not afraid to say it. Uh, and, and a lot of the things that the Lord shows me, you know, I, I've continually seen him prove himself to me to the point where he's built that confidence because I know his voice and um, I'm not saying I'm infallible but I, I am saying that that when he wants to tell you something you know it's him and you, you you become to a point where your faith is in him more than man and Dean has had this gift much longer than I've uh, you know been around and so I want Dean to share some of his end times visions maybe one or two that are that are significant maybe three but uh, maybe then also just get into the overview, the scope of the implications of maybe what we have next coming to our country. And then maybe we'll talk the Mark the Beast after that. Yeah, well, let me let me share this, too, about you. And that's just one of the things that blessed me when I met you and I started hearing what you... The fact that you heard from the Lord very strongly about the pre-trib rapture not being true and not being the way it's going to play out. When I heard you say that, knowing that you were going against 90% of churches out there that teach a pre-trib rapture and that you're willing to stand for the Lord. I knew then because see, I go back all the way to 1989. I came back to the Lord 87 by, so I'm, I'm just fully walking with the Lord, baptizing the Holy spirit. I'm doing nothing but studying the word, preaching, going out on the streets, witnessing. I mean, I'm just living for Jesus hundred percent fasting all the time. Well, during this time period, the Lord tells me, he said, I want you to fast for seven days. This was in uh, probably September 89 time period. And so I didn't know why, but I just obeyed the Lord. And I was fasting for seven days and I was just reading the Bible and I'm just praying. And I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me and he said, read Matthew 24. Now, I had read that passage many times. My first sermon in the church was on Matthew 24. I was very familiar with it. But when the Holy Spirit tells you to do something, you do it. So he said, read Matthew 24. So I read it and nothing. I'm like. Okay, Lord. He said, read it again. Okay, read it again. By the fifth time, <laughs> I saw it. It was like the Holy Spirit light boom came on. And the Lord was like, where do you see the rapture in this chronological, sequential outline? Where do you see the rapture? Is it before the Antichrist and the Great Tribulation and all that? Or is it after? And you know, Jesus, remember Jesus said, these are, they asked him, what would be the sign of your coming to the end of the world? He said, these will be, these are the beginning of sorrows, wars, rumors of wars, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. He said, these are the beginning. Then and he says this, then this will happen. They'll deliver you, be afflicted, and they will kill you. And really yeah. the words there say the Christians will deliver each other up. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's a whole another issue about yeah. the, the, the love of many will grow cold. Well, that's agape. Yeah. The only people that have agape love are people that have the Holy Spirit shed that abroad in their hearts. So you're correct. Nazi Germany repeated. Yes. yes. But he said these things will happen. Then this will happen. Then, and then he says, then you will see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. That's the Antichrist. Then he says, then will be great tribulation such as the world has never known. There will false Christ and false prophets rise and deceive many. They'll do great signs and wonders. He's saying all these things. Then, 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 meaning after this, after this, after this. No rapture. If the rapture of the church was before all this, it would have said that in the beginning of the chapter. Instead, it says, let no man deceive you. Yeah, he says, let no man <laughs> deceive you. Three, three, four times there, he says, basically, don't be deceived. But this is the key. I got to verse 29 when Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give off its light, the powers of heaven will be shaken, the, the stars will fall. He said, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. And it says, then he will send forth his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. 
And that's when my eyes were opened that there was no preacher. Because let me tell you, in 1989, no one in any church that I knew of or any TV preacher that was even a good preacher was preaching that, you know, they were only preaching a pre-trib rapture. Yep. And I started, God had me start speaking the warning all the way back then that we were not getting out of here before the bad stuff. And any prophet or any teacher or pastor that comes along and says, oh, we're getting out of here before the Antichrist, before the mark of the beast, all that. It is a great deception. And, you know, the Lord winked at that 30 years ago. Now that we are getting so close to the great tribulation, the mark of the beast and all that, there's a, it's not a game anymore. It's not, he's not allowing it to just go on. And, and, and the people that keep preaching this pre-trib rapture, false doctrine of blanket, you know, false security are going to be held accountable for it. They're going to he's have told to me the same. When, yeah. Whenever I was 19, got kicked out of a church, I'll make it quick because I want you to continue. But I, I was a Tim LaHaye guy. My first ever vision was of the rapture. And when I had this vision, I was 14, and the sky was dark. The earth had been torn by war, and we were in the mountains hiding away in a building, having church service and preparing for a feast, and then lightning struck, and we were gone. So, you know, I got ridiculed by the youth pastor by that, oh, it's just a metaphor and blah, blah, blah. And no, it was a real vision. I still remember it vividly. But that's Matthew 24 is what I saw. Um, and so so I, I later on, I was leading worship. This pastor... Um, this pastor was preaching on the the rapture a three-part series and um you know they all loved me i was moving in the gifts like everything was great guys i was not a rogue a rogue prophet okay i was just there moving in the gifts trying to heal people and and deliver people and and that was my that's really the heart under what i do not just busting down false doctrines i like to help people but but you know the lord told me that night thus says the lord there is no pre-trib rapture. And he gave me an entire three-page thing to bring to that pastor. And he told me in there what Dean just said. He said, for every single person in his or any man's congregation that starves, falls away from the faith because they lose hope, and that's going to happen. Yep. It's, it's coming. Or if you know, for every single mom that doesn't have a pantry full and doesn't know what to do because these lies that were told to them, the Lord will hold their blood on their heads. And that's what he told me to tell the pastor. And they didn't let me remain, put it that way. But continue. <laughs> I, I wanted to make that point because I wanted to know, I know you've had some battles with some people, and I know some people watch your, your stuff that, that battle with you over this issue, but you're not alone. And, you know, I wanted to, it to be known that God revealed it to me after he led me on a seven day fast. And on day five, he had me read and opened me up. Now, since then, I've studied it out in absolutely no doubt in my mind that the rapture is there is a rapture. It's really called the first resurrection. And it's going to happen on the last day, like Jesus said, he the said, day I, of the Lord. Yeah, the day of the Lord. And we're and uh, we're actually called up before the seventh vial of wrath falls because that's when all the islands are moved the mountains are brought down all the cities of the nations are brought down that is the great day of his wrath the same it says remember it says when he said about lot he said the same day lot went out of sodom it rained fire and brimstone and destroyed them all so will it be in the days of the coming of son of man the same day so the same day he takes us up to the marriage supper the dead in christ rise first we which are alive we're going to have the marriage supper there's actually going to be 30 minutes of silence in heaven because we're going to be in awe of the judgment of God that falls upon the earth. Praise him. Then, then we're going to have the marriage supper and it's not going to take a long time while all that's going on and we'll be with him. And then there comes the point where Jesus now brings us with him back, back to take see, people forget about that part to take over. <laughs> and you see this and that's revelation 19 that revelation 19. If you look at it, you see the seventh vial of wrath right before that. It says what the lamp that he said, the bride has made herself ready and the marriage that's when it happens. So the bride is brought up there right as when all of this is coming out. So yes, we're delivered from the wrath. We're not delivered from the persecution and we're not delivered. Nowhere does he say he's going to deliver us from tribulation or persecution. In fact, Jesus said this prayer. I pray not that you take them out of the world, 
but that you keep them or protect them from evil. Uh, you know, the, the word there, I, I don't know if I heard you teach on this, but now I teach on this. The word keep there is only used twice in the New Testament. Once there and once in Revelation 3 when it says, uh, uh, talking about, I will keep you from the hour of trial. It's the same word, and the, key, the word in the Greek there means to preserve and protect, to put away. So it's it, all it really means. It's just the same as Israel and Goshen in the Exodus. The plagues were coming down, and God took them to the wilderness. Th the same thing happens in Revelation. The bride, the woman, and sorry guys, there's no difference between Israel and the Gentiles. It's one one tree. We're grafted in, and and unbelieving Jews are are not the bride until they get saved. That's just how it works. So the woman that flees to the wilderness is us. We are the ones that God protects in the woods if we got to go to the woods from the wrath of the dragon, from the drone armies, from the Antichrist system. We're going to have to run. That's what Stones of Zion is doing, is building a refuge. And we have contingency plans because we're not fools. We know that there's, there's a moment where there's just an absolute escape coming. And that, that's going to be supernatural. But we are the bride. We are the woman that he will preserve and feed in the wilderness. So. He promised the gates of hell, look, yes, there's going to be martyrs. Yes, there's going to be persecution, tribulation. There's going to be all this thing. But he promised that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. Now, not everything that calls itself his church is his church. In fact, he gave the parable of the ten wise virgin. I mean, the five wise and the five foolish, the ten virgins. So we know there's going to be foolish ones out there. But he yeah. said that for his church, his church, I, he said the gates of hell would not prevail. And I tell people all the time. There's going to be people here that are alive and remain into the coming of the Lord, and they're going to be taken up. So that means they survive all of this stuff that's going to be happening in the world because of God's protection. I had a vision, open vision, wide awake, getting ready to go to church on a Sunday morning, open vision while I'm praying. The Lord shows me, a, it's like I'm watching a movie. The Lord shows me a predator drone flying to my house here where I live in Alabama with missiles to basically blow my house up okay and I'm, I'm watching it's like i'm watching a movie screen and i see this hand huge hand come out of the sky and swat this drone down like it's a little bug right before it ever gets near my house oh yeah and the, and the lord's words are so clear don't worry i got you i got you it doesn't matter what they bring and i've told people i said you know what if it's my time to go so be it. I'm ready. I don't care if it's a guillotine or a bullet or a bomb or whatever. But if it's not my time, I don't care if they bring an entire division of soldiers against me. It's going to be a bad day for them. You see, it's God. God is the almighty. He's the creator. And uh, there's nothing they can do unless they're allowed to do it. <laughs> nothing. Amen. You know? you know, I got got two comments on that. So, uh, something this is this is something the Lord has shown the light to me on is the the five wise virgins. They make it through the night to meet the bridegroom. The night is the tribulation, and those who are prepared physically, mentally, and spiritually, just like Noah, just like Joseph, just like Jesus and Mary and Joseph when they fled because God told them to flee Herod for a time. You have to listen. You have to obey physically as well. Uh, and if you do, then he, he the Lord loves our body, our soul, and our spirit. He doesn't just love part of us. Uh, and, and so he has a good will for us. And I, I like to spread that, that hope, and it's not a false one. But to also um, speaking on, uh, oh, what was it? There was, um, darn it, I, I, lost, I lost the point. But go ahead. Keep going, Dean. <laughs> well, you know, I was going to say this. You know, I tell people all the time, you know, you said it a minute ago, and I just want to repeat it. There's an only the other time we've got these plagues and these things that are going to happen. These, you know, the, the wrath of God and these different things that are going to happen, you know, in the Old Testament. I said, but, you know, God did this one other time and it was in Egypt. And I just asked people a simple question. Did God take his people out of Egypt before the plagues or after they were over with? Did he protect them? And then when they answer that question, I say, why is he going to do it any different? So we are going to go through, I believe we're going to go through the entire tribulation period. 
Um, there's no doubt. The Lord has shown me about America. You know, there are people that think America is Mystery Babylon. I do not agree with that. I believe it's very clear that it's the Roman Catholic Church and their power and influence all over the world. They are the richest entity on the earth. And that's that's a whole other subject. But what I want to say is that America, people say, well, what is America? And I feel like God did sovereignly raise up our country and to be a blessing to the world. And for the most part, we have been because Christianity has, you know, because of prosperity here, Christianity flourished and because of freedom, because of lack of persecution and restrictions, the church has been able to flourish. And we did for many decades. And we used a lot of money and sent a lot of missionaries to the world and did a lot of good and, and helped a lot of people. The Lord hasn't forgotten that about America. It's kind of like with Cornelius. It was like a memorial. And what the Lord told me about us is that, yes, our, our leaders and many of our people have turned to wickedness. We know 65 million abortions. We know about the homosexuality, now the whole transgender push. And we know the evil that the New World Order has taken over most of our government. So we, we know we're in trouble. But the Lord has told me this. He told me that, yes, judgment's coming to America, that we're going to be attacked. I've seen the nuclear detonations in different places. He told me that it will not be a full destruction. I've seen the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States in vision through times of fasting. I've seen the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States pretty well destroyed. Not every city and spot, but, but devastation down each coastline. Most of our military bases are on the coastlines anyway. Um, and the Lord told me that that he that we would be invaded by China, uh, by Russia, and by Muslims that would come in through the southern border and be in Canada, and that we would be invaded, and the Chinese would actually invade uh, the West Coast and make it as far as Colorado, and then he said, "I will push them out." And the Lord, so the Lord, what the Lord told me is just what He told Jeremiah in Jeremiah five. He said, "I'm not going to let them make a full end of the country." And that there will be pockets of protection over his people in different parts of the country. And that we were to stand firm. We would see enemy troops and we were to stand firm and trust him. But that America, there, there's going to be part of America that makes it through this whole thing. And um, he, because he's not, he's not completely done with us yet. And you think about it, if you look into some of the, the minor prophets and you see how it talks about Egypt will be judged and uh, Moab, Edom and all different countries are going to be judged. And he says that, you know, some countries during the millennial reign will be allowed to continue. Russia is going to continue. Uh, Egypt's going to continue. Uh, the United States will continue in the millennial reign. There'll, there'll still be, you know, we're going to rule and reign over nations and cities and countries. There's going to be a reestablishment of these things. There are certain countries that will not be allowed to exist anymore. I feel the spirit so strong on this. Yes. And um, but that, you know, so there's what I'm saying is, yes, it's going to be difficult, but there is hope. And your hope is this. Look, I tell everybody this. Jesus is our he's our high tower. And we run into him and we're safe and we're to draw near to him and trust him. And, 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 and you know, here's the thing as Christians too, we're not supposed to be afraid of death. We're supposed to be prepared for it. And what I'm saying is I don't know my fate in this last days scenario. I've, ha I've had them try to kill me numerous times. I've literally had bullets go by my ear. I've heard them. I I've been shot at and that God's protected me. I've had, I've had assassins sent that I've had witnesses that saw three guys get out of a car with mask on with guns coming at me in a church parking lot. Years I mean, it was, they were doing they were going to shoot me in front of people. They didn't care uh, because I was helping people out of Satanism and there was a serious case going on. But bottom line is you got to just I, if you know, I was in Nigeria in 2006 and I got seized by the government and some of them were Muslim because the Muslims and the, the so-called Christians there kind of wrestle over the government. But I got seized. I was supposed to go into the country to preach for my second time, but I got held. And from noon until midnight, then three soldiers came, AK-47s, and walked me a long way into the darkness and through these empty mm. hangars. And I'm thinking, we're walking out into the jungle, and they're going to put a bullet in my head, and that's it. And I said, Lord, if, if today's it, I'm good with that. I'm fine. I'm ready. 
you know, if you're not done with me, then you're going to deliver me from this situation. They keep marching me further and further out. The next thing I know, we open the door and we're out on the tarmac way out at uh, Lagos International Airport. And I see a KLM Dutch aircraft sitting over there with the, the stairs down. And I said, well, they're either about to shoot me in the head or they're going to put me on that airplane. <laughs> and they mm. march, they march me over to that airplane and they said, and they never spoke to me the whole time. And they said, and we got to the steps and they said, go. And I went up the steps and they set me down in first class because that was the only seat left. And I flew back to Amsterdam and flew home. But I say that to say that there was total peace because I was okay if that was if that was the day I was to be killed for my faith and be with Jesus. And this is what I got to get across to Christians. Quit desperately trying to cling to this life and everything in it. Understand that we are we're, we're, we're our time here, regardless of how much it is, is still a vapor in the wind. It's just temporary. And we're to be prepared for our day of death and not be afraid. Remember, Paul talked about the fear of death is torment. And I'm not afraid. I told, I've told people, I said, if they put my head in a guillotine, I'm going to look at them and I'm going to smile. And I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to be right back. To take care of, to take care of you and my king's going to be with me he's going to set up his kingdom i'll be but i'll be with him you're going to see me coming back so y'all enjoy the short time you got i Amen. mean this is what i'm saying i i saw and i've shared this and you probably heard me say it i, I was i watched lively during the isis terror of the middle east me too a lot of people shouldn't do that. I tell I told my wife, you're not watching it. Yeah, it'll affect you in a in a negative way if you if you're not prepared to watch that. Yeah. But I, the the one of the most awesome things I saw, though most of it was horrific and terrible. But I saw them getting ready to hang a pastor, and he was I think he was I think it was in Syria. It may have been Iraq. I can't remember, but he was a pastor of a church, and they said he was a pastor. And they had a little crane up there and they had the rope hanging down and they had him on a little thing and they put the rope around his neck. And while they're putting the rope around his neck, they, he knows they're about to hang him. He is smiling from ear to ear. Wow. I said, I said, that man knows Jesus as his Lord and Savior right there. Yeah. Said, That's where we have to be. I I want to live as long as God wants me to live here. And I will do what is necessary to protect my wife and my children and try to preserve life. We should do all of that. But we also can't be afraid when our day comes. And Jesus has warned some of us will die for our faith in him and our walk with him. And that's just, that's part of it. I have something on, on that subject. And, and I, I was just prompted just definitely share this right now um if and this is for the listeners um if you want a key to survival it's to die right now and if you want to know how to inherit god's favor and protection go ahead and sacrifice yourself right now to the lord on the altar if you want the most divine uh, protection you want a swarm of angels around you to stop bullets go into every fight willing to die that is what will give you the greatest protection in the days to come is a heart like that that says send me I'm going whether whether I'm gonna come out of it or not that will give you so much favor of the Lord and you can do it for his favor because you're going to be laying down your heart in the process and your life put it all down and die to yourself today and see what God does next you know I just wanted to put that out there that's how you that's how you can overcome death is by dying right now <laughs> amen. amen we must we must lose our life to find it that's what he said amen and we must, and we must deny ourselves to do that and and you know I don't have any death wish I'm not I'm not 
ready to go anywhere. Um, but I'm ready if that if that's what it takes. And, you know, uh, I remember them, you know, stories of the martyrs in the Colosseum singing as they were being killed for their faith and how many Romans would be in the stands at first cheering and then crying and then going, I want what they have. Um, you know, we, we're to be a witness in life or in death. Either way, we're to be his witness. Amen. Well, uh, if we can, if we can go to, we'll close it out after this. Um, maybe close it out with a little prayer too, but maybe just a little bit on the timeline of where we're at and the mark of the beast intel. Uh, you know, and we can just do a quick overview of timeline. I think you and me kind of see it the same, obviously without giving uh, dates and stuff, but just kind of the general timeline we're on right now. You know, somebody asked me the other day before the eclipse what I thought was going to happen, and I said, I think it's like Y2K, much ado about nothing. There's no, I said, one thing I know for sure is not going to happen. The rapture's not going to happen. I said, but, and I was right again, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I said, you know, we know, we know that within where they are now, uh, and I'm talking about the world economic forum people, the United Nations, the globalists, where they're going to create a world government is what their, their whole goal is. Um, and that they have the technology, they've, they've stated their goal. Uh, Klaus Schwab, I have the video of him. He said in 2016, within 10 years, people will have, everyone will have a chip under their skin. Uh, his prophet, Noel Harari, Dr. Noel Harari has said, total surveillance will be under the skin, free will will be over. Um, we know that they're working toward this. And so 10 years from 2016, we're looking at 2026. Now, I'm not saying they will have their goal completed. They may or they may not, but we know they're getting much closer to it. Um, I believe the COVID pandemic was part of that and part of the plan. But it's it, some people have said that they believe that that was part of the mark of the beast. I don't know. The mark of the beast we know has to be something implanted. What's interesting is the word in the Greek is something engraved. And the King James always had it right in the hand or in the forehead. I've studied the Greek there too. It's undeniable. Yeah. And so what something engraved, a, a silicone microchip is engraved with something called photo etching. It's, it's used, they use light to etch the circuit path in a silicone microchip. Now, a lot of people have seen the microchips that are about the size of a grain of rice that have been implanted in people's hands, like in Sweden and different places in the world. But you can almost, you can still see those and you can still feel those. They're, they're still actually kind of big. You know, I mean, it's still a grain of rice being implanted. It's not that invasive in your hand. But what we know, and I can't give the, let me just say this. I personally know someone who is high up in academia who has recently been given access to go underground to a lab. This place wanted to hire them because they don't know they've become a Christian. And long story short, uh, they have seen the new microchips that are much smaller, the implantable ones with a battery that are RFID that can be read from now they're going to, you know, used to the, they could be read from about 50 feet. Now they're going to be read all over the place. Um, like part that, of the actual network, yes. global network. Yeah. A global um, network. Nope. <laughs> but, but then, then on top of that, on top of that, she, she has seen them. They're much smaller. They're already been mass produced. Um, they're ready for rollout. Well, do you, do you have any info? Uh, do they somehow interface with the body? Yeah, I think you're, what, what we're realizing is the body heat will probably keep the battery running. They're developing that where it'll, it'll keep it going, right? But here's what's interesting. I also, right before Skyfall 2023, our conference we had, um, right before that, I came across a company called um, BlackRock Nanotech, basically. And... Um, Come to find out, you know, we've, we've heard some talk from Elon Musk talking about Neuralink and actually putting chips in people's brains and 
helping them if they lost the use of a limb or were paralyzed and how that could restore their abilities to do this. Well, Elon successfully Musk, tested this year for the first time. Yeah. But what, what we, what, what I found out was that Elon Musk and Neuralink is, is a smoke screen. They've been doing this since 2004, this nanotech BlackRock people. They've already planted, they've already perfected chips that are planted in a person's brain that can restore sight, hearing functions, but also control the emotions. Like if you have PTSD and things of that nature, DARPA has admitted that they have technology that can, they can put into a person's brain like a soldier who has PTSD and control his thoughts and emotions. It's part of the super soldier program. Yep. So what we have is the technology. See, a lot of people, I remember people say, well, the mark of the beast, you know, it's just never happened. They've been talking about it since the fifties and sixties and the seventies. And then there was how Lindsay's book, the great late, great planet earth and all this stuff. And it never happened. I said, but, but they didn't really think back then because the mark of the beast has to be something implanted that can communicate with something that's connected worldwide. And back then, you go back to the 80s, the internet for the common man and the computer, uh, the computer networks, the wireless systems, all of this stuff didn't exist. In fact, the, the first micro, implantable microchips did not come into being until the 90s. So it wasn't until then that we could even have the possibility of everyone receiving an implant that would control all buying and selling worldwide. We didn't have that, but now with the internet, now with all of these new technologies to implant the brain and the hand, it's all here. And they are talking about the world elites talking about within a few years, doing away with all cash, having all digital currency and everything being in you having your own digital account. And they talk about having it in a wallet, but of course people lose wallets and cards. So it's going to be implanted. It's going to be mandated. And when that happens, when that, that implant is mandated worldwide, we know we are three and a half years into the seven years because that's when we know it says when the antichrist does this, he has 42 months to continue revelation 13. We know when that is mandated and that's when things, that's when the great tribulation or the great persecution begins, because if you don't receive that, you're going to be cut off economically. Then you're going, it says you're going to be marked for prison and death. So that's Robin when, Hood. yeah, that's when things are going to get intense. And do I think that that is possibly, we could be there in 2025, 2026, 2027. Yeah any of these years in the next few years we could get there it could be implemented i believe and i'll just say this i believe there's going to be another pandemic created by the, the elite just like they did the first one there's going to be another pandemic and after that is when they're going to come in with full full control and uh yeah and and their whole i have the book from a uh from a professor, an Ivy League professor, and uh, where it's he all the, the whole book where he talks about the, the cash is over. The, the world, all the nations of the world and all these elite groups have already agreed they're going to do away with cash transactions. India has already done it. You, you can't even go to a street vendor in India and use paper money. You cannot do it. And, and I have Indian people in my church have told me they come and go from India. They said, we can't, we can't use cash anymore. Uh, so you're, you're going to see the Chinese social credit system and digital currency system go worldwide. Yes. That is, that is their goal. And this is what the Bible foretold. So it's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, everything you say, it, you know, completely matches uh, the timeline. And as you well know, the Lord gives us, uh, the end from the beginning, he gives us as if if you're a prophet, you you you're given it. It's not just that you have a vision or you have a word. You're the Lord actually commissions you for a purpose. So he gives you a scope of sight on any number of subjects, whether that pertain to a country, whether that pertain to a congregation, whether that pertain to the world, whether that pertain to the body of Christ in general. So the Lord gives you a an entire scope, a mission. And so over the years, uh, amidst all of the end times visions I've had, uh, you know, your 
your uh, prognosis here really matches, uh, you know, what the Lord has has led me to see. Um, also, I, I want to re-mention. So, uh, obviously, I, I caught I caught where you were able to go and not able to go when you mentioned you know a person you know that that has seen physically the mass printing of these high tech nano chips that have have some sort of interface with the you know body heat to power them and you know, probably further technology. Dean on the day, and I just want to stress to the audience when he says that it's not a loose. It's not a loose connection. I don't want to intrepidate on, on any further on on his uh, revelation here. Uh, but you know, it's not a loose connection of his. This is a very, very uh, close source, and it's a pretty miraculous that he came to this. But um, the 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 very day that Dean told me this on the phone, I was speaking to him about the mark of the beast. We were talking about some things, and I mentioned out of my mouth, I said. Um, yeah, the, the Mark of the Beast technology is going to be here soon. And the Lord stopped me. You know, this was within a few days of talking to Dean. Forget who I was talking to, but the Lord stopped me and he took me, he showed me a vision of underground. And I saw that this was already here. And he stressed to me that it was already made. It was already here. They had already like figured it out. The whole package was ready. And because he stopped me in the mid sentence as I was telling somebody, yeah, they're about to have the mark of the beast technology. Holy Spirit stops me, shows me a vision of underground. Within a day or two, Dean confirmed this. So that gives it a little more weight when the Lord is giving you a vision, confirming it within a couple days. And uh, like I said, it's not a loose connection, and that's as far as we need to go there. Um, but concerning what you said about the order of events, uh, you have something to say there? Well, I was going to say, yeah, it, it was a highly secure facility yeah. that they had access to. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so so um, I wanted to say concerning your timeline uh, uh, discussion, I was recently this December shown a vision, and this one was very intense, and all of the ones that I share – uh, are are the top level of like you wake up in cold sweats you know that you know that you know it's the Lord no questions asked this is from God I don't play around with things where I have questions and I don't give I don't give uh, obscure visions or dreams I give things that the Lord is like this is the one you know and so this one I was um, I was in America and all of a sudden the entire and I, I was I was overviewing America, and a lot of these visions I have, angels will like pick me up by the scruff of the neck, like a cat, and they'll carry me the, in the air over nations or over places, and sometimes they'll drop me in the middle of what's going on and say watch, and they'll tell me to to watch these things. So this was kind of like that. I was lifted up over America, and. I saw that there was a mass blackout event and I started going higher where I could see more of the world and this mass blackout event was like I knew in my spirit in this vision that it was pre-planned um, it was it was it was an agreed upon uh, reaction to uh, maybe maybe our, our our desire for freedom but either way this was a cons conspired agreed upon plan there was a mass blackout event in the world uh, lockdowns began happening. Martial law started breaking out in various areas. The, the, the vision I started traveling over the land quickly. And, and as I was traveling, I could see that certain cities were worse than others. There was martial law happening. Um, so, uh, the countryside, where people were already more self-sufficient, it didn't hit them as hard. Uh, they, they, I could see that they got really... Um, territorial and really you know got their got their uh, night watches going so i could tell that the 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 lockdown affected places differently and then i was carried over the sea and i was flying over europe and then the middle east i was going that direction i saw in the middle east i saw uprisings i saw people just losing it because it is as if all of our communication systems the global connectivity was wiped out something had happened a blackout event where they had just agreed to say, let's push the red button and cancel everything all at once. And so there's martial law in various countries. Some countries were at more peace even during this. 
uh, and so, but most of it was just pretty chaotic. So I'm carried over there. I'm dropped, and and I was definitely being carried by one of these angels. This happened in multiple visions, and I was dropped in the middle of the Vatican Square, and I was in a uh, I was in a bunkhouse, uh, you know, a condo at the Vatican Square overlooking it, and in this condo, I'm looking down. I could see the people of the Vatican were were very uh, distraught as well. Uh, it was darkness. The skies were dark. Um, you know, there was there was just, and I think that was more of a symbol, but uh, the the darkness of the skies. But I'm looking at the Vatican Square. The Vatican makes an announcement. Uh, Calm down. There is there is a uh, there is a soon announcement coming. Do not leave your rooms. It was it was a limited curfew martial law situation at the Vatican, but it wasn't that bad. They were just encouraging people. Don't cause any trouble. We're about to give you the answer. So I I look down and the Pope comes out and he's wearing all of his Pope gear, nice gems. You know he's he's poked out like I like to say, and uh, and he's got the nice gold staff. You know he's just really looking his best that day, and he comes out and uh, and he raises his staff and everybody kind of starts gathering, and he wasn't able to really calm them down fully, but he was able to gather them, and I all of a sudden I see a man besides the Pope and he's tall dark and handsome he's he's olive skin dark uh, dark you know dark hair um, very handsome very charming and this man started to speak and the Pope pretty much gave the floor to this man immediately as soon as he started to speak everyone was mesmerized and I was not mesmerized but I was impressed because I you know being in the entertainment industry uh, Dean was in the modeling industry it was just like man this guy's got it going on you know I was like he's got his stuff down and and so as soon as he spoke it was like it was like not tyrannical he wasn't he didn't come out like a tyrant he came out like a smooth superstar and he was smiley and just he had it go he just had it down and he noticed that I was looking at him and he and I zoomed in on him and I could see the 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 evil within him no one could see it but me and he smiled at me with this most grimacing smile but nevertheless a smile and as soon as he knew I was seeing him he ripped open his suit and he was wearing gold and it was the shiniest gold desirable above all other gold it was it was very shiny and it reflected a light and he bore his chest up to heaven and he smiled at heaven while this light was shining up and his attitude and what he was saying in his spirit was they love me more than they love you to God and I knew it was the Antichrist and there was an angel in the room next to me that I could actually perceive at this point um, you know, I see the light, you know, the angel. And he said, And he will declare himself to be above all which is called God, but it will happen in another temple than this. That's what the angel said. And so that was the end of the vision. And I just wanted to say concerning what Dean said on the timeline, you know, I do believe that in the next few years when I when I look ahead with the prophetic seer gift you know you you have limited ability to through a glass dimly look ahead um, and when I see 2026 I see I can't see it I see dark you know uh, I think leading up to there we're gonna go through so many tumultuous events as part of our judgment in this nation um, and it's going to culminate in a final move where they're going to have no choice but to consolidate world power into this one system that they're already announcing. And I think that move of consolidation is probably them pushing several buttons, like pushing the pandemic button, pushing the blackout button, pushing the hacker button, pushing the World War III button, all of them at once. Just picture Austin Powers, Mini Me is having a heyday, okay? He's pushing all the buttons. And so I, I believe that out of that, consolidation of power as Dean mentioned 
they're going to offer the the prime solution of which they already have and you know we know the Hegelian dialectic but basically uh, considering that vision considering what Dean says my whole point is I, I really agree I think in the next few years we're gonna see them make their moves to to fully consolidate world power under one umbrella and and that's means we're in a late hour uh, what would you say to that Dean oh I agree hundred percent I agree with everything you, you said there, everything you saw, because uh, I've always believed that the Pope, uh, from a young man, I feel like the Lord showed me that the final Pope would be the false prophet to assist the Antichrist, and that they will work together for a season, and then the Antichrist will even turn on him, uh, the Vatican, and destroy Rome. And, yep. uh, and so, yeah, I believe all that. They, they will have to, at some point, make their full move, like you said, to consolidate all of their power, and to do that, they have to cripple the United States. They, they really have to cripple Russia and China. And that's why they're trying to provoke the three of us into a major war, because that kind of uh, helps them. If, if we're weakened by a war between the three major powers, then guess who becomes the most powerful? The UN and the, other, the powers that want this world government. They're going to have it. They're going to have it for a season. I mean, that's just... What God said, he said, you know, probably one of the most unpleasant verses for Christians is Revelation 13, 7, where he says that power was given to him uh, over the saints to, to overcome them, to prevail against them. And he says it both in Daniel 7 and in Revelation. So uh, that's where the season of persecution is going to come. It's just like when Nero and some of the other Caesars decided, okay, that's it. We're, we're going after the Christians. That's when it's, that's when it's really going to begin. And um, like you said, it's I, I I agree. There's going to be multiple buttons they push from war to blackout to hacking to pandemic to the you know they, they're they're going to pull out all of the stops. They're, they they will actually be allowed. See, God does this. He would like I'm taking when He decides to say, okay, I'm taking my hand back. All right, devil, you can go ahead and fully implement your plan. Um, and it's all then it's going to. It's all going to go down and it will be quick. And the Lord told me, in fact, I was going back looking for a message for somebody today. And I saw one of my messages from a couple of years ago. And I said, things will, and the message was things will change quickly, like suddenly. Uh, a lot of people are going to be completely caught off guard. It's going to happen so fast when it starts. Boom, 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 boom. And uh, that's that's why you prepare and get ready now. My, my most recent uh, spontaneous prophetic utterance which i you know i don't force those like uh we see all these tv prophets do um i i just do them when they come and and they don't come as often as every five seconds so um <laughs> more like every five or six weeks you know what i'm saying <laughs> but um now the lord speaks to me daily but but when we're talking about overall big prophecy but the word was and i have a, a video on it it's called suddenly is declared upon or suddenly is decided upon this people says the lord and he just he just took over and started speaking through me through this this utterance it was a real utterance and and he he said through it and and i knew while i was saying it what he was really meaning is that he himself has decided that suddenly these things will come upon this land because that's what we deserve so only his elect only those who are hearing and obeying today will have any sort of clue and even even most christians the lukewarm the people who are lying about the preacher of rapture the lord himself has decided that their judgment will be sudden and it will take them by surprise and their reaction will be their test and that's what the lord has shown me so you know i i concur with that as well yeah. Sadly, I also believe this. I believe some of the churches, you know, years ago, going back to around 2000, I think it was 2012, 13, Obama was in office. But I, pastors across the country, and I got sent one too, you got sent an, an envelope from FEMA inviting you to come and go through their training to be one of their, uh, how do they put it? I guess. Clergy one, response teams. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And, you know, you got a, you got a government ID out of that you 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 know that you can flash when it all goes down 
I believe there's some pastors that are completely sold out to the government. They don't they don't understand the balance of Revelation. I mean, of Romans 13, and they don't understand what's going down because they don't study their Bibles and they don't hear from the Lord. And I think that a lot of them, uh, they're going to be places where people churches are going to be places where people actually line up and get the mark. I, I actually believe it's going to happen. I do too. Uh, <laughs> I, I had I, I won't tell the whole thing, but one of my very profound visions was they were all preparing for a wedding feast amidst a harvest field and a dragon falls from the sky and he's curled up like an asteroid until they go they literally drive out and pick up this dragon and they, they these are the church they're preparing for a wedding feast they're having a big party in a mansion in a harvest field they're not working in the field they're preparing for a party they pick up the dragon they bring the dragon back to the party and I'm warning them the whole time, and the dragon starts eating all of them. So I think they're going to bring the dragon right into the churches. And uh, they don't know what he's going to do to them, and it's very unfortunate. But that is, it already happened in Nazi Germany. If you think it can't happen again, then be be one of the fools that doesn't listen to history. That's your decision. It's not mine. Uh, <laughs> exactly. That's, yeah. that, I've said before, it's like, why do we think, you know, somebody would say, oh, you're conspiracy theorists and all this stuff. It's like, why do you think these people disappeared? You think there's nobody like Hitler or Mao or Pol Pot or Lenin or Stalin? There's no nobody that would actually love to wipe out uh, tens of millions and hundreds of millions of people. And they've stated it. They stated they want to bring the population of the world down to 500 million. It was written in stone for a while in Georgia, uh, the Georgia Guidestones. But their goal, like Bill Gates and some of these others, has always been their eugenists. But they're, they're satanic, Luciferian elitists. They they want to destroy mankind and bring the population down because they think they will. They want to rule over and have the, the resources of the earth for them and their wicked uh, children and grandchildren. I mean, that's their goal. Same and play as as the fallen ones before. They want to create a habitation for themselves and they want to kill God if possible. Same right. same play. And they're fools. And, that, and that's why, you know, I tell people about CERN. Everybody talks about CERN's opening a portal and whatever. I don't believe there's a machine made by man opening a portal to hell. I believe man can do rituals and things and actually bring spirits up. But bottom line, what CERN is, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit laid this on my heart years ago. He, tell, he laid on my heart. He told me, he said, CERN is their attempt to find a new subatomic particle that they think they can fashion into a weapon to fight Jesus when he returns. Because they know the nukes, the nukes they tried to use in Operation Fishbowl and Dominic could not blow up the firmament. They know the firmament's there. They know they can't, they couldn't detonate it. They are seeing it says they will make war with the Lamb. They are planning for war against Jesus Christ. And so they are they're looking for a weapon to do that. Um, and, and the devil has blinded them with, with all of this transhumanism agenda. They believe, that, and they say this, that Lucifer is going to help them fight God when he comes. And that Lucifer is going to give them the technology and the power and the ability to fight Jesus when he comes and to win. And that they're going to have eternal life through technology. Um, they're going to be able to live forever. Through that, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna, and 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 really, what did the Lord say about when they the Tower of Babel? He said, "If I leave them alone, they will accomplish some of these things, and they are going to accomplish that. You know, there's going to be things that I mean, look, they accomplish the atomic nuclear bombs. I mean, they accomplish things that are destructive and and evil. It's going to so, be like a Marvel film for sure. Oh yeah. Well, you, you know, it's interesting when they did that what was it x-men apocalypse they made the villain who was coming back who said you know the most powerful mutant of all time that was coming back that he had four horsemen that he came back with and that when he spoke he said some called me yahweh and yep in game immediately, yes immediately i knew see to them they're trying how did they create mutants some of it was quote natural mutations right some of it was what alien technology some of it was uh you know uh technology like iron man type type stuff 
Well, what they what they remember, the whole thing was they're going to use the super soldiers they created, the mutants they created, all the technology they have to fight this being who's coming back. And what did they have this being like? He was evil, claiming to be Yahweh, God, saying he was going to destroy this world and create another one, which is exactly what the Lord says. He's coming back to destroy the wicked and the wicked things that they have created. And he's going to reestablish the earth. For his people, the meek shall inherit the earth. And they literally play that out as God is the enemy. And they put that in the movie. And you're just like, they're showing you that they know this battle is coming. They do. You know, uh, I'm just going to mention this for, for hope's sake. Uh, have you have you studied on, you know, the, the, the New Jerusalem that's coming down, obviously, you know how the dimensions are are uh, are all exact. Yeah. You know uh, height, width, depth, right. all of that. Well, it's either a lot of people say it's a cube, um, but it can also be a a a cylinder. You know, it can be a circular thing, um, which is similar to the Tabernacle of Moses. But, anyways, that's a whole other subject. But um, I I have seen a glimpse one, and and in this in this vision I saw first I was in the Biden White House and he was signing these papers and I saw the devil outside the door and I knew that if he signed these papers that all these things would happen and I was lifted up by an angel taken forward over America in time. At first I saw buildings crumble and I saw and he dropped me he dropped me in the streets and he said watch and. This is a summarized version, but uh, I, I was telling these people to get out of these buildings, get out of the cities, is what he told me to warn them. And these people were wearing white, and there was a lot of people that were gray. And so there was Christians among them, and they just would not listen to me. And the buildings, there was attacks that came, and earthquakes, and, and, and a lot of these cities were ruined. And I was crying and sad. You know, these emotions hit you hard in these, these experiences. Angel picks me up again, flies me forward again, and... As I'm going forward, these birds are flying back, whispering in my ear, you don't want to go ahead. It's a sorrowful thing that's ahead. You don't want to see what's ahead. And the angel looked at me and asked me, uh, you know, he, he didn't speak because you just know what they're saying. But he, he said, do you want to go ahead? Do you want to proceed? And I said, yeah, I'll, I, I can take this. And so I saw Chinese troops on American soil, and they, they were specifically lining up people in white more than anyone else and they were killing them firing squads in mass mass amounts women children and men they did not care they were lining up Christians and killing them and they were Chinese for sure and I was t I was bawling my eyes out at this point and then the angel picks me up again flies me forward again and then we hit this this crystal invisible wall we hit it and beyond it he said we can't go any further but I could see through it. And before me, I saw a golden, huge building, solid gold. I saw millions of people dancing with banners. All the women were wearing beautiful colors. The men were wearing beautiful colors. Everyone was just looking wonderful. Everyone was dressed modestly. Uh, you know, it was the Millennial Kingdom for sure. And it looked like Avatar. I mean, it was so beautiful. Everything there was jungle. There was no there was no cement nasty cities everywhere and then the forest over here. It was all nature mixed with this giant beautiful building and there was like stones and bricks. Everything was naturally built and everything was beautiful and everyone was dancing and singing and praising. And then the angel took me back from there and I didn't want to leave and he dropped me back in the White House and he said, If he does these things, he said you will see all of these things. And so I was trying, I was in the White House again and Biden signing papers and I'm trying to rip the papers up and I couldn't. I was very angry and, and sad at that point. Uh, and then that was the end of that vision. But I just wanted to share that. I, I know the Lord showed me a glimpse of the Millennial Kingdom and the hope we have and the inheritance we have even despite these things and despite what we're going to have to go through is so wonderful and peaceful and joyful that anything we have to face here is completely worth it. And that's that's not even 
that's not even counting you know a lot of y'all have seen the the uh, translation testimony I had which was not me leaving my body by my own will it was a painful experience that the Lord gave me um, at first it's not it's not a comfortable thing to be separated from yourself uh, you know but the Lord showed me what he so showed Ezekiel in heaven after I had that experience um, I don't fear death I there I nothing in me wants to even be here anymore except for to help as many others get there as I can you know deep down it's it's just like you don't ever want to be here nothing here is even a hint of as wonderful as the things he has for us or even just simply sitting next to him that is so much more uh, beautiful and wonderful than anything we experience in this life the greatest love that you could ever have here just pales in comparison just for a moment with Jesus and I say that as a witness not just as a imagination so just want to put that hope out there and also Dean thank you for coming on here too oh absolutely thank you for having me man. and I know you've seen the Lord as well and I'm sure you can attest to that yeah he he appeared to me in uh, 1987 in October early October and I was praying one night about two three in the morning wide awake whole room opened up to the side I saw in the heaven and the glory of God. I saw I saw the, the, the glory of the Father. I saw Jesus standing in that glory. I saw the wings of the dove extended out over him. Mm. Um, and the, the power of his presence was so strong, I had to tell him to ease up. I couldn't, I was, I could not take anymore. And that's when he spoke to me. One of the things I can't say, some of the things he told me not to say, but there was one thing he told me, he said, now think about this. This is in 1987. Think of where we are now. But he told me, he said, son, he said, waste no time for there is little time left to spare. And basically he told me, you get busy preaching my word and warning my people and telling my people. And I've done it since then. I have preached this stuff and talked about his coming and about the warning it's ever since I've never quit because it is that serious and uh, he's allowed me to see heaven. I've seen where I've, he allowed me to walk through heaven and I knew I was on my way to my great grandmother's house and my great aunts that prayed for me and prayed me in the kingdom. And I was walking through hills that were so beautiful that I can't even describe them. And I, and I, and these massive lakes between these huge mansions and the, 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 the color of the grass and the flowers and the trees and the, everything was so different than here. Mm. So beautiful. And I remember thinking I was going, I knew I was going to their houses and they lived beside each other and that we were going to have a big family gathering, a big family get together and meal. And it was like a, a reunion. And uh, that was powerful. And then when my mom passed away, wow. my mom passed away in 2010 and I had led her to Jesus. And uh, I, you know, I knew it was her time. The Lord even told me that, you know, um, I knew that when I saw her in the hospital and we laughed and talked, I spent like a whole day with her. He said, this is the last time you'll see your mom here. And sure enough, I went home and she died a couple of days later. But I was, that was on October 2nd of 2010. It was a Saturday. And uh, I wasn't, we weren't having church at that time. We had taken a break. And I went, I said, well, I'm going to church. So I went to visit this church that we had visited a few times. And I'm sitting in the back row and I'm a mess. I mean, it's my mom. I love my mom. I knew it was her time. I knew she was born again. But I still was like, you know, when it's, it's your mom. You just, you got one mom. That's it. And I was crying and just, you know, but it, I was just a mess. And they started praising worship and I started worshiping the Lord. And immediately I saw that like God opened heaven up for me to see. And Jesus was standing there in front and my mom was standing in front of him. They were face to face. Not they were. And I was over here. They were looking at each other and I was over here looking up at this. And my mom had on a white robe and she looked like she did when she was like, 28 29 30 years old i mean she was you know my mom had been sick and so she had lost a lot of weight so she looked like a skeleton when she passed away but she looked beautiful healthy i mean every part of her was different just alive like she was brand new she didn't look at me but the lord turned and looked at me 
And he said to me, this is what he said. He said, thank you for helping one of my children make it home. Hmm. Wow. And I'm like, he's thanking me. But we have a we have a job to do. And I tell people all the time, our job it's tough sometimes, but it is to try to take as many people to that place and get them to to know him and follow him and be with him forever because we that there is a hell, there is a separation from all that is good. And the Lord doesn't want anybody to go there, but they have to come his way. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I'm, I'm in all that. So, you know, bottom line, everything we do preach, say, would be to try to get people to come to know him and be ready for, for that time, whether they die or whether the, the rapture comes, but they need to be ready. They don't want to miss that. Amen. So, you put two you put two witnesses together that have seen the Lord and we could probably keep going for another ten hours. <laughs> uh, Dean, I love you. I, I look up to you. Uh I'm gonna continue to call you for advice as we do what we're doing. And uh Anytime. you were you were a godsend and, and you helped me uh just to let you know because being faithful and courageous and having some of the church hurt that I've had uh, has been a tough a tough road because I didn't do it out of I didn't do it out of pride or avarice or I'm the one lone chosen person. I did it all the times I stood up against these men. They were men that I I loved a lot, and I already had issues you know in my past with with you know my dad not being there. So it was so painful for God to tell me to stand up for truth and know I'm going to lose, you know, uh, yeah, at least closeness with somebody that I, I really cared about. It was a challenge for me. And I always valued God more than them anyways. But I'm just saying it, it's, it's helpful to have you around because I know that I can trust you to even hold me accountable as I go forward as a minister and yeah. I, I just appreciate that a lot. You know, and we appreciate you. In general, Stones of Zion, all of our board, everybody looks up to you and what you're doing. And I would love to have you on for another show where we can get nitty gritty about cosmology. And I, I do love to delve into the continued, uh, continued Nazi agenda that you know uh, that you well know of, and and how they they integrated into our societies, and how Hitler's original dream of having this television screen to control and program everybody has now come to reality in a, in a deep way. So I would love to talk about that and NASA and all of the above on another program. Good. But, yeah, they, it would take a whole one to do that subject. Yeah. Oh yeah. But I love you a bunch and, and uh, I, I better let you go. And, and if you can close us in prayer, that would be great. Hallelujah. Well, father, we thank you for this night and we thank you God for, uh, Lord, I thank you for your raising up younger men that hear your voice, that have seen uh, your visions that you give, and that, Lord, want to operate in the in the full moving and gifts of the Holy Spirit, and that, but want to stay true to your word and prepare your people and call them to repentance and to faith. And, Lord, I just I bless my brother Dalton. I pray you do great and mighty works. And, Lord, you're already doing them, but that you keep him, protect him, and his people around him that are working with him, their staff and board and everything that you're going to do through them, Lord. I, I know he's hearing from you and I pray you keep him on your path and I pray you keep me on your path, Lord. And that, Lord, we just want people to know Jesus and to be uh, saved and living holy and ready to go to heaven when they die or when Jesus comes. And Lord, we we pray for that, that you help us do all that you've called us to do and to be able to say like Paul, I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. And uh, then we get to rejoice with you and all the people that we brought with us. And I pray that we bring many more and it's in Jesus name. Amen. And uh, listeners, uh, I'm going to pray for Dean real a quick prayer. Uh, Lord God, 
who is above all, you are wise in all that you do, including testing us. I am asking that you would heal Dean's ailment in his leg. I ask that you would heal him in Jesus' name. And I'm, I'm, I'm asking with all the others that are with us, in Jesus' name, that you would touch Dean and heal him in the name of Jesus. And just ease this, this thorn in his side. He's faithful to you, Lord. And if there's any sort of infraction that is unknown or hidden, I'm just asking that your mercy would, would break through such a thing in Jesus' name. But we call upon your great mercy and your great kindness to bring healing to Dean in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for this program and thank you for your listeners. And uh, we'll be talking to you again, uh, Dean. Amen. That sounds right. great. God bless you. You too. Have a good one.